Judge, can the parties approach the bench? As soon as Madam Clerk calls it, we can do that. Case number 2020 the state of Florida versus Sarah Boone. Pardon the number, can I just go to the record beginning with the state? Dave Cash, Carl, I have to say. William Jenkins, State. Defense. James Owens for Sarah Boone. Tell me how you're saying for Sarah Boone. Good morning, ma'am. Can you state your full name and date of birth for the record for me? Sarah Boone, 101077. Ms. Boone is seated at council's table wearing a black jacket and a white uh, multicolored shirt. Looks like some splotching on it. She is in custody. However, she is not uh, wearing any restraints. So we will be standing when our jury panel enters and exits. Um, the parties may approach. <clears throat> All right, state, anything we need to address before we bring in our panel this morning? Not from the state. Defense? No, sir. All right. Ms. Boone, just a couple of questions before we bring in our panel this morning. Are you still satisfied with your lawyer's representation of you in this matter? Very much so. And are you still on board with the strategy that they are uh, utilizing in your defense? Yes. All right, very good. Let's go ahead and stand and bring in our panel. State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Yes. All right, everyone can be seated. Right. Members of the jury, good morning. Welcome back to 12 Alpha of the Orange County Courthouse. I hope that you all had a restful weekend and enjoyed your time with your loved ones, your friends, and your family. Just if you could, I gave you a long instruction on Friday before we broke. Uh, if you could please confirm that you complied with the court's instructions by raising your hand at this time. Record reflect that all members of our panel have raised their hands. Now, members of the jury, um, I know the line to get in this morning was quite long. So um, the lawyers have reminded me that on the right side of the entrance of the courthouse is a jury only line. So if you can make your way all the way to the far right side of the entrance, there's a jury only line. Yes, sir, juror number two in the back. Huh? It was still quite long? Okay, thank you. I uh, just wanted to bring that to your attention. If you did not know, um, obviously if you're stuck, you know, we're we're waiting on you. So don't feel anxiety or anything. If you're stuck in that line, we can't start till y'all get here. And I appreciate again, your sacrifice and your attentiveness in this um, process. With that state, you can call your next witness. Steve will call Dr. Sarah Zadovich. Good morning, doctor. Could you please state and spell your name for the record for us? Sarah Zadovich, S-A-R-A-Z-Y-D-O-W-I-C-Z. -Z. Thank you. You may inquire. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Can you tell us, what do you do for a living? I'm a forensic pathologist. And who do you work for? I work for Orange County. Uh, we cover Orange County and Osceola County. And uh, how long have you been a forensic pathologist? I've been at this office for about 12 years and then um, one year uh, in Tampa, so about 13 years. And what type of educational background do you have to have to be a forensic pathologist? Uh, so I have a bachelor's degree in kinesiology from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I went to medical school in Kansas City, Missouri. After that, I went to um, Cleveland, Ohio to do a one-year rotating uh, clinical internship. After that, I went back to the University of Wisconsin. I did my residency in anatomic pathology and clinical pathology. Uh, I have two fellowships or subspecialty training. One is in cytopathology from uh, Northwestern University in Chicago. And then I did my forensic pathology fellowship in Tampa. Is continuing education um, something that you must maintain in order to hold the position? 
Yes, I have to do continuing education for my board certifications, which is in anatomic pathology, clinical pathology, and forensic pathology. And I also have to do separate continuing medical education to maintain my medical license for the state of Florida. So tell us, what are your duties as a medical examiner? So we're involved in what's called the medical legal investigation of deaths. And that just means that we investigate certain types of deaths. And there's a Florida statute or a Florida law that states which types of deaths that we'll be involved in investigating. And in general, uh, they're deaths that are not natural. Um, so accidents, suicides, homicides, or deaths that are natural, but maybe unexpected. Um, those are the types of cases that we're involved in. And again, that Florida statute lays out exactly which types of cases that we'll be involved in. And the reason we're involved in that is our goal is to determine cause of death and manner of death in those individuals that we're investigating. Could you tell us what an autopsy is generally? So an autopsy is also called a postmortem or after death examination. And there are kind of two main parts to it. Uh, the first part is what's called an external examination, which is just as it sounds. So that's making observations about um, an individual. So hair color, eye color, um, height, any sort of unique markings like scars or tattoos. Um, and at that time, we're also looking for any external signs of diseases or injuries. Um, after that, we go to what's called the internal examination. So that means that we open the body cavities, we remove all of the organs and dissect all of the organs. And again, as we're doing that, we're looking for any signs of diseases or injuries that might help explain why that person died. And we can also add um, ancillary tests or other tests. So things like toxicology, microbiology, um, it's a little bit dependent on each case, but we, we have uh, options for other testing as well. Can you tell us what is the cause and manner of death? And is this something that you document? Yes. So cause of death is either a disease or an injury that ultimately results in an individual's death. And so it's very individual and unique to that individual. Manner of death is a way to categorize or group similar types of deaths together. And for manner of death, there's only five choices. So there would be natural, accident, suicide, homicide, or undetermined. So those are the manners of death. In your career, approximately how many autopsies have you performed? Around 3,000. And have you previously testified as an expert witness in court? Yes. Uh, how many times? Uh, between 75 to 80. And in what areas have you testified as an expert witness? Forensic pathology. Turning our attention to this case, uh, did you perform the autopsy? Yes. And what were your findings as to cause and manner of death? So the cause of death, um, which I put on the death certificate, is positional asphyxia with environmental suffocation. And the manner of death, was, I classified as homicide. Now, when you perform your autopsy, what information do you have <laughs> at the time that you begin uh, that exam? It's incredibly variable. I can have a lot of background information. Sometimes I have none. It just depends on the particular case. In this case, what information were you provided? So the information that I had was that the decedent was with uh, his girlfriend. And um, at some point in time in the night, he got into a suitcase, which was then zippered shut. Um, at another point at time, I believe she went to bed. Um, and then um, the next morning discovered that he was still in the suitcase. And I think that was in about an 11 hour time frame from the information that I had. You mentioned uh, asphyxia. Can you explain uh, for us what asphyxia is? Sure. So asphyxia is a very general term. It would be kind of like saying, you know, I drive a car. Right? That's very generic. And we know that there are many different types of cars out there, right? So asphyxia simply means lack of oxygen or inadequate oxygen for an individual. And there are different categories of asphyxia. So you can have... Um, um, suffocation, which just means that there's obstruction of the airways. So that could be 
smothering. That could be somebody choking on a piece of food or maybe just being in an environment where there's not enough oxygen in the air to sustain that individual. There's a category called strangulation. That would be compression of the neck, either blood vessels or airways. Uh, there's another category called uh, mechanical asphyxia. That can be when the body is in an unusual or abnormal position where the actual mechanics of breathing can't occur. So that can be the position of the body, or it can be like, let's say if a heavy object fell on somebody and, and you simply can't breathe because of the weight of that object, that would be a mechanical asphyxia. And then there's drowning. That's a different type of, of asphyxia. And there are a couple of other um, um, categories as well that are much less common. Is there a most common type of asphyxia? The most common would be um, ligature compression of the neck. So that would be like an event, a hanging. That would be the most common that we would see. You also mentioned environmental uh, suffocation. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more what that means in more layman's terms? So that just means that there's not enough oxygen in the environment that the person is in. Um, you could think of somebody who's in an enclosed space where there's a fixed amount of oxygen. So as that oxygen is, you know, as that person is breathing, they're using up all the oxygen. And once it's gone, there's no oxygen left. Or you could think of um, maybe people who are, you know, climbing Mount Everest. There's not as much oxygen up there, and that's why they have oxygen tanks. So it just means that the amount of oxygen available in the air around that person is not enough to sustain them. In this case, um, what can you tell us about how long George Torres was in that suitcase? There's not a really good way for me to give you a time frame um, as to how long he was in that suitcase. Again, because you know, there was both the component of positional asphyxia, being in an unusual position for a period of time, and then also the environmental suffocation component. Because you know, within that suitcase, certainly there's going to be oxygen, but it's not going to be the same as if you were sitting in a room like this. Um, and because there are those multiple components happening at the same time, there's not a really good way to estimate or say with scientific certainty, oh, he was in for X amount of time. There's, there's really not a good way to do that. How about, is there any good way to um, approximate or determine uh, the time that George Torres died? There's not a good way to do that either, again, um, because there are so many different components at play um, at the time uh, of his death. You know, sitting in a normal room like this, the percentage of oxygen that's available is about 20 to 21 percent. If that were to drop to 10 to 15 percent, um, there the person can be um, impaired with judgment. They can be impaired with um, activity. Once that percentage drops between eight to 10%, most people will lose consciousness. And at a percentage of 8% oxygen or less, that's when we would expect the death to occur. And so again, there's not a really good way to measure the amount of oxygen that would have been available to him in that suitcase, in addition to the fact that he was in um, an unusual position. What position were you able to determine he was in that suitcase? I wasn't able to see uh, what position he was in. By the time that our medical legal death investigators were at the scene, he was already removed from the suitcase. Um, based on some of the, the findings, um, I favor that he was most likely in like a fetal type position. So knees flexed, arms flexed, and the head most likely flexed forward. But again, that's from my findings. I, I didn't see what position he was in. What side of his body would he be resting on in this fetal position? That's that most likely his left side. However, I do say the caveat that some of the findings are dependent on time, meaning that you know if that suitcase had been moved or flipped over, um, my find the, that could be different than what I'm seeing at the time of my examination. Tell us, what is skin slippage? So after death, the body goes through a series of progressive changes. And one of those changes is skin slippage. And 
what that does is it tells me that that person is a little bit further away from the actual time of death. So it's not something that's going to occur immediately after death for most people. Um, it's something that would occur a little bit later on in that process of changes that happens after death. And tell us, what is rigor mortis? So rigor mortis is also called the postmortem stiffening of muscles. And again, that's one of the changes that occurs after death. Um, most of the times that will occur before we see skin slippage. Um, but these changes are very variable from individual to individual. And it also depends a lot the environment the person is in. So for example, those changes that we're going to see happen more quickly in a warm environment. Um, if somebody who maybe is engaged in a physical or violent struggle, those changes are going to occur more rapidly. And then it also depends on the person themselves, you know, their, their relative size, um, their relative health. Those things can all impact the changes that we see after death. How is skin slippage and rigor mortis uh, inform your findings about how long George Torres was likely in that suitcase? So again, you know, the time frame that I had um, was about 11 hours just from the last time that he was known to be in the suitcase versus the time that he was found. So I'm basing it off of that. So about an 11 hour time period. Well, when I did my examination, the rigor mortis was already dissipating or leaving. Um, also, there was some skin slippage. And so um, if he had not been in the suitcase, if he had been out of the suitcase, I would not expect that advanced amount of change. Um, so um, it's compatible with him being in that suitcase for a longer period of time. It would have been warmer. Um, and also if he had been, you know, struggling to, to get himself out, you know, engaging that physical activity, those are things that are going to accelerate or speed up that process. So my findings at the time of the examination are compatible with that 11 hour time period or you know, somewhere around there. Additionally, did you note any injuries to the body of George Torres? Yes. These injuries that you noted to the body of George Torres, uh, did you document them on what's called a body chart? Yes, the diagram on a body chart, and we also take pictures as I'm going through my examination. Your Honor, may approach the witness who has been previously marked for identification and shown to defense as states are? You may. Ma'am, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification as states are. You recognize this document? Yes. And can you tell us, what is this document? Uh, that's a copy of my body diagram. Sorry, oh, it's a copy of my body, body diagram. And does this fairly and accurately represent uh, the, the diagram that you created in this case for George Torres? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to move what's previously been marked for identification as states are into evidence. No objection. What was pre-marked as states are will be received into evidence without objection as states 12. Your Honor, request permission to publish? Yes, sir. So ma'am, uh, on this body chart, uh, can you describe for us uh, and point out uh, what was the, the first blunt impact injury that you identified? So there were some blunt impact injuries to his head. Um, I don't I don't think it's on this uh, one, but there were some blunt impact injuries to his head right up here around the eye and on the mouth area. And then did you uh, notate any injuries to his hand? Yes. So there were some um, ecchymoses, um, or you can think of that as like a, a large kind of bruise on both hands. What other blunt impact injuries did you identify? So there's a series of um, ecchymoses on the left side of the back, right about here. And... Any others? 
Uh, there were some on the forearms as well. And uh, you use this body chart, you say, in addition to photographing the, the, uh, the, mm -hmm. the injuries that you document, correct? Yes. Part of your examination, um, and I believe it's on the body chart itself, do you document the height and weight of the person as well? Yes. And what was the height of Mr. Torres? So, yeah, so technically for us, it's length. Height is the measurement that's taken while someone is standing. So his length uh, was 62 uh, inches and uh, his weight was 103 pounds. In regards to these uh, blunt impact injuries, um, how is it that you come to the conclusion that these injuries were the result of blunt impacts? So these are typical wounding patterns for blunt force trauma. And when I say blunt force trauma, that can mean something striking a part of the body, or on the other hand, it can be the body striking an object. Um, and that causes uh, injury to the skin, to the soft tissue, and sometimes the deeper tissues, depending on how severe or how strong uh, that blunt force trauma is. Are these uh, injuries consistent with a person being struck with a baseball bat? They could be, yes. Are they consistent with a person being pushed down a flight of stairs? They could be, yes. Can you say whether or not these injuries occurred while George Torres was in the suitcase? No. Why is it that you cannot say that? So they, they all, all of these injuries seem to have occurred around the same time, meaning that they're relatively acute or new. They're not, they're not things that are healing or something that happened last week. So they all occurred around the same time, but there's, you can't, really look at a bruise or a contusion and say, oh, that happened two hours ago. There's not a good way to do that. Are these injuries consistent with, uh, with occur them occurring while he was inside the suitcase? Yes, they could be. As part of your examination, do you also check the toxicology of George Torres? Yes. And is that something that's pretty standard in any autopsy? Yes. And what were the toxicology results uh, for George Torres? Uh, so there was a blood alcohol level of 0.139 milligrams per deciliter. And there was also caffeine and nicotine uh, detected as well. That level of alcohol, is that uh, over the legal limit uh, in the state of Florida's drive? Sure. So for driving under the influence, that's a 0 0.08. So that is, is higher than that. What does that alcohol level at the time of your autopsy tell you about George Torres's level of impairment 11 hours earlier? So I don't necessarily know that it was 11 hours earlier, but it was at the time of death, at or near the time of his death. That's what the blood alcohol level was. So at that level, you know, everyone reacts a little bit differently to alcohol. And some of it has to do with whether or not somebody is accustomed to drinking alcohol or if they've never had alcohol. So you can develop tolerance. Um, but at that level, um, there's going to be impairment of judgment. There can be impairment of motor skills. Uh, there can be slurring of words. Um, something that's called disinhibition or lack of inhibition. Um, and again, it's really variable from person to person, but those are the, co the common things that you would see at that level. Would that level of alcohol impair the ability to problem solve? It, it can, yes. You also... Um, stated earlier that you document um, your autopsy findings also uh, photographically, correct? Yes.
Your Honor, may I approach the witness who has been marked for identification as State's Q and been shown to defense? May. <clears throat> Ma'am, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification as State's Q. Did you take a look at this composite of photographs uh, to yourself and then look up uh, once you're, uh, you're finished? Ma'am, do you recognize these photographs? Yes. Are these photographs uh, a portion of the photographs that you took in your autopsy of George Torres in this case? Yes. Do they fairly and accurately represent how he appeared and how his injuries appeared to you uh, at the time you performed your autopsy? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to move what's previously been marked for identification as stage Q into evidence. No objection. What was pre-marked as state's Q will be received into evidence without objection as state's 13. In your honor, request permission to publish. You may do so. Ma'am, I'm showing you Photo one from the state's composite. Tell us, what is this a photo of? So this is the identification photo that's basically just showing uh, from about the level of the collarbones up. And this is George Torres? Yes. Did you note uh, any uh, signs of injury in this photo? Yes, so there's some... Um, Echimosis uh, around the left eye. This picture, it's a little bit hard to see, but I think there's another one coming up. There's also an area of echimosis up here on the left side of the forehead with also some swelling um, associated with that. Um, the lips have some um, contusions and small lacerations. And then on the left shoulder here, you can see a little bit of uh, some echimosis here, or again, echimosis are kind of like big bruises. Turning to photo two from state's composite. What are we looking at in this photograph? So this is his right arm near the elbow. Um, and right here, you can see this kind of darker area. So this looks similar to an abrasion, but it's actually, um, it's what's called drying artifact. And again, this is one of the reasons that I think that he was in that suitcase for a little bit longer. Most likely that was an, a pressure point where part of that suitcase was uh, resting on his uh, elbow in that area. And then after death, that tissue dries out and, and that's the discoloration that you're seeing there. Turning to states, Three from the composite. So here you can see a little bit better. Um, I don't know if you can get a feeling for this, but this area is what we call edema or swelling. So this whole area is edema. It's a little bit discolored, so echimosis. And then again, really at the corner of the eye here, um, you can see that darker discoloration. And so that's those are injuries from blunt force trauma. States four from the composite. So this is the left shoulder and arm. So again, you can see this kind of red to purple area. So this is all echimosis and then a couple of linear abrasions or scratches. States five from the composite. 
This is the same area, just a little bit closer up, so you can see uh, this whole area of ecchymosis. It's a little bit variegated, differential in color, but again, that's all blunt force trauma. And uh, what part of the body is this we're looking at? Uh, this is the left shoulder. States six from the composite? That's the same area, but uh, in this picture, we have a scale or the ruler. And uh, why do we use scale of rulers? That's just to give an idea of how big the area is or how large the injury is. States seven from the composite. So this is the left forearm and hand, and you can see the area right here, that's a little bit uh, red to purple, and then also right here on the left hand, right here and here. Those are all areas of ecchymosis, again, blood force trauma. States eight. From the composite? Again, the left arm. Just from a little bit of a different angle, so you can see, and a little bit with the elbow too here, but you can see all these areas. <coughs> Thank you, Moses. Okay. Yes. States nine from the composite. And now looking at the left hand, a little bit closer up, so you can kind of see a little bit better these areas. If I can watch these. Six ten from the closet. And again, the left hand, just closer up. States 11 from the composite. So now we're looking at the back, and you can see that there are these uh, linear um, abrasions in the mid back. Are those scratch marks? Or? They could be scratch marks. They could also be um, blunt impact, um, more of just a straight on blunt impact, especially being in that suitcase um, if there are objects in there. What is the discoloration that we see uh, around his shoulders and? Um, and then and some other uh, spots on the back. So. Sure. So you're talking about this area? Yes. So that's called liver mortis or lividity. And that's one of the changes that we see, again, after death. And basically what that is, is it's postmortem, after death, settling of blood um, in the blood vessels. And so it's dependent on gravity and it's dependent on the person's position. So what I mean by that is, we're seeing it on his back because after the time of death, at some point in time, he was more uh, positioned um, on, on his back. And the areas that are lighter, that's because for a couple of reasons. It could be the position of the body, meaning that it's not in the you know gravity dependent position, or there could be something pressing on it. So either one of those. Stage 12 from the composite. So those are those linear abrasions just shown a little bit closer up. Stage 13 from the composite. And the same, uh, but with a scale. Stage 14 from the composite. So now you're seeing the left side of his back and also the back of his left arm. And you can see these areas here of ecchymosis, and these are a lot darker than some of the others that we've seen. Um, one of the things that I did is I looked underneath the skin in these areas because it's, they're so much darker and so much more dense. So I wanted to see if there was injury of the deeper tissues. So these areas are associated 
with hemorrhage or bleeding into the skeletal muscle, so the deeper tissues. And so that's just indicating more force applied to that area. And when you did your uh, internal exam, uh, did you examine this area and did that inform your findings? Yes. Stage 15 from the composite. And that's showing those areas a little bit closer up. So you can see that they're much more dense. There's at least three distinct areas here. Um, that could, there could be more than three impacts, but there's at least three separate ones that can be seen. Stage 16 from the composite. This is just showing the upper back and the back of the neck. Uh, we've got a linear abrasion right here on the back of the neck. And these were the ones shown in the earlier pictures. And stage 17 from the composite. And this is just showing the same area of the back and the back of the arm, but just at a different angle. So we have discussed and seen evidence of many different injuries. In total, how many blunt impact injuries uh, did you identify? I can't give you an exact number. Again, you know, you can have multiple impacts in a very close area. So it can be hard to, to discern each one. They can overlay each other or they can be so close to each other. Um, so, but at least, you know, five to six, most likely more than that. And when you were uh, going through your body chart as well, uh, and I guess we also saw uh, some of it uh, photographically. Uh, you also mentioned um, uh, impact to the left side of the head. Yes. And I believe that was subgelial? Uh, subgelial. So kind of similar to what I was describing on the back, um, I looked at the um, underside of the scalp. And so in those areas on the left side of his forehead where there was the edema, when we reflect or we fold the scalp over, there was hemorrhage or bleeding that was went through the entire scalp and was uh, deposited on the skull. Um, there was no associated skull fracture and there was no bleeding inside of the skull, but it was all in the scalp and uh, deposited on the outer surface of the skull. So under the skin, but not under the skull. Correct. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Any cross-examination? <clears throat> yes. Doctor, good morning. Good morning. My name is James mm -hmm. Owens, and uh, I'm one of the lawyers that represents Sarah Bandy. I've got two questions. Can we first talk about, talk about the toxicology? Yes. The alcohol. Approx you said you've done approximately 3,000 autopsies. And of those autopsies, how many years would that have been? Over that period of time? Uh, 12 years. Okay. So when you first got down here from Tampa, I think you were up in the Northeast, came down here to Tampa, that's when you started? Yes. And you, you would agree you've interpreted toxicology results in all or most of those cases? Most, yes. And you did order the blood alcohol test of the decedent in this case. And you, you said he was a 0.38. Uh, no, 0 0.138. 0 0.138. Yes. And you also ordered the vitreous level yes. of alcohol as well. And the result was a 0.213. Yes. And you would agree that's about, um, it's about three times the legal limit. Close, yes. Now, you would agree that um, at those levels, there are some uh, pharmacologic effects from the, from the body. Yes. And I know you mentioned some, but you agree that, that that level of alcohol in the body would impair somebody's judgment. For most people, yes. And their decision-making abilities. Yes. Uh, and it would release inhibitions. Yes. And they would be um, 
more more apt to take risk that they otherwise would not. Yes. And of course, it would impair motor skills and potentially loss of balance. Yes. It would also impair coordination. Yes. And eye coordination as well as fine motor skills. Yes. It also impairs memory, alcohol does. Yes. So there are lots of effects that ethanol has on the body. Yes. Now, you're aware in this case that George Tor Torres, the decedent, stepped into the suitcase under his own power in a game of hide and seek. That's uh, how it was reported to me, yes. Do you have any evidence to dispute that? No. Can you tell us when Mr. Torres drank the, the last drink he had prior to getting in the suitcase? That I can't tell you because, um, you know, if somebody had been drinking either periodically throughout a time period or continually throughout a time period, that's difficult to say. So he could have stopped drinking an hour before he got into the suitcase or five minutes before he got into the suitcase or four hours before he got into the suitcase. Yes. We just don't know. That's Correct. Cool. Do you have any idea at the time of the autopsy whether or not he was in the elimination phase? Uh, so metabolism? he was in the metabolic phase, yes. The elimination phase is what I refer to it as. But yes. Okay. All right. Now I want to talk about time of death determination. It's fair to say that you did not go to the scene that day that Mr. Torres was found. No, a medical legal death investigator from our office went to the scene. So there was an investigator with your agency named Ashley Hammer Hammermeister? Yes. That went to the scene? Yes. And she would have prepared a report? Yes. And you would have reviewed that report? Yes. Do you agree that fire and rescue assessed Mr. Torres at 1.07 p.m. on that date, February 24th of 2020? Yes. Does that sound about right based on your case file? Yes. And so um, this investigator that we mentioned, she did not arrive on scene till 6.27 p.m., so nearly six hours after the body was discovered, she arrived. Yes. And the body was laying supine stretched out? Yes. In front of the suitcase? Yes. Now, you examine and assess the body of Mr. Torres at the time of the autopsy? Yes. And you said that the body was ambient temperature? Yes. Is that the, that, is that the normal air temperature we're in today? Uh, whichever environment you are in, yes. So the body was not stored in a cooler for 24 hours? No, the body was stored in the cooler. Um, but in the mornings uh, when we get there, the bodies are brought out of the cooler. Okay. How long had the body been out of the cooler before it was examined by you? Do you know? Um, most likely an hour to an hour and a half. Now, you said that the lividity was in the back, correct? There's lividity in the back and also on the left side of the body as well. And, and you agree the body is stored at the morgue in on its back? Correct. Now... Were you aware of the last time that Miss Boone, my client, actually saw her boyfriend alive or observed him in, in the video, in the, in the suitcase by video from I, the phone? I think in the report it was around 12.30 or 1 in the morning, somewhere around there. Have you looked at either one of those uh, videos from her phone? I briefly saw one that the uh, detective showed me. Do you know if that was the two-minute video or the 22nd second video? Um, I believe it was the shorter one. Okay. So would it be fair if I said the time last scene was around 1130, would you dispute that or? No. Okay. Um, so really, from the time, I guess it was 1130 that evening with the videos, and then um, you understood that the body was found around 12 hours later the next day or so. Would you agree that uh, the, the death occurred sometime within those two periods of time? Yes. Sir. We don't know exactly when that is. Yeah. But it would be a guess if we tried to speculate about that. Yes. Now, considering the, the 3,000 autopsies, how many cases have you ruled the cause of death as positional or postural asphyxia? 
Uh, a handful of times. It's not very common. So about five times or less? Yes. And we're going to talk about environmental suffocation in, in a little bit, but uh, let's talk about this positional asphyxia component. What was your ruling in those five cases that you ruled that it was positional uh, asphyxia? What was your ruling in terms of uh, your diagnosis? I'm going to object as to relevance. The objection is sustained. Doctor, you're, you're familiar with Dr. DeMaio, Vincent DeMaio's textbook of forensic pathology? Yes. Would you agree that that's authoritative? I'm sorry? Would you agree that's authoritative or well-accepted book? Yes. Environmental suffocation is a lack of oxygen. You would agree? Yes. Now, how many of those cases have of the 3,000 that you've done where you found environmental suffocation? Uh, probably two to three. So very few? Yes. In a positional asphyxia case, um, that's kind of an example. Like you get stuck in a hole and as you breathe, you sink deeper into the hole or it tightens. It can be anything that impairs the actual physical aspect of breathing. So that could be if the neck is flexed very much forward. So that way, cutting off the air supply up towards the top of the head, that could be something compressing around the torso. So not being able to take a full breath. So those are examples of. of or another example may be falling out of a tree stand and getting suspended upside down. Yes. Or the majority of the blood gets in the top half of the body. Yes. Would you agree in those type situations that the deaths occur fairly quickly, usually within an hour? They can. It depends, again, on the situation. Now, you said Mr. Torres was 5'2 five, five and 103 pounds? Yes. Do you know how big the suitcase was that Mr. Torres was in? Uh, I don't have the exact measurements with me. So if I told you the measurements, you, you wouldn't know one way or the other? Okay. No, I think they were described to me and I saw the pictures from the scene um, and I was able to review crime scene photos to see what the actual suitcase was like. Okay. Uh, do you know the crown to rump length of Mr. Torres? No. Did you do any demonstrative study on the suitcase to determine what kind of spacing he would have inside that enclosure? No. And you don't know the position that Mr. Torres or his orientation at the time that he was in the suitcase was? Again, I favor a fetal position, <clears throat> but again, I didn't observe him in the suitcase. But you don't, you don't know exactly what the positional component was that, that caused or, or what led you to believe caused his death. Correct. I mean, based on his stature and what the suitcase was, you know, he would have had to have flexed at the hips and knees to be able to fit into the suitcase. So based on what you said, you would agree you didn't know uh, how much Mr. Torres would have been able to move and stretch his various extremities inside the suitcase? Do you? No. So you would agree that his repositioning inside the suitcase would have been easier if he, if he didn't have so much alcohol in his bloodstream? I don't know that I would agree with that. Excuse me? I don't know that I would agree with that. Well, you, you said his fine motor skills would be impaired by the alcohol. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought you meant his ability to just move. Yeah. So reposition but, himself inside this, that would be limited to some degree by the alcohol he consumed. It could be. I mean, that's not really a fine motor skill. Okay. Or, or the use of his hands to, to, to unzip the suitcase would sure. be affected by the alcohol that he had consumed. Sure, that could be. Okay. <clears throat> Now, the environmental suffocation deals with the lack of oxygen. Yes. Correct? And due to that insufficient oxygen that we breathe uh, in the air, so you, you essentially run out of the oxygen in the space. Yes. So I guess the years ago, uh, how this sometimes would occur was a child would somehow get into an old refrigerator and it would be enclosed. So it was airtight. And eventually you would run out of oxygen. Yes. You would agree with that? Yes. 
And I think you said the normal makeup of air has about 20% oxygen? Yes. So we had either a decrease in the oxygen levels or a low concentration of oxygen. In yes, system. yes. And also, you know, keep in mind that while he's in there, every time he's exhaling, he's pushing out carbon dioxide. Okay, so again, whatever oxygen is there is most likely diminished because it is an enclosed space. It doesn't have to be no oxygen, but it's decreased from you know, what we, what we would have in a normal room. But every time that he's exhaling, there's more carbon dioxide that's in that space as well. So that, that displaces any oxygen that might be there too. So what volume of air do we inhale and exhale in a normal breath? Well, it depends. I mean, you can take a deep breath, you can take a shallow breath, um, it, it depends. And then there's also the rate at which people breathe. So that's variable. So we, if it was average, would you say 500 milliliters? On depends on the person. Well, would you agree that uh, at rest, you take a normal number of breaths per minute of 12 to 14? That would be considered the normal range, yes. So six to seven liters per minute? Yes. Rest? Um, do you know the volume of room air contained in that suitcase? No. Do you know how porous the fabric of that suitcase was? No. Did you run any tests on the suitcase? No. Were you aware that this the suitcase, the, the lock on it or the zipper on it was broken? The pull handles were broken? Yes, I didn't know that. Do you agree if, if there is a portion of the zipper that's open that air can travel in and out of that space? Yes. Do you know what the anticipated exchange of gases would be through that fan? No. Do you know if... You know, the suitcase was out in the rain and it rained. Do you know, you know, whether or not uh, rain or the liquid would, would pierce the interior? I don't know. So from what I, from what I gather, no studies were done on the suitcase. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. So we don't know that zipper being busted, what exchange of air could go in and out. Correct. I think you said um, there are physiological effects once the, the value or percentage of oxygen is decreased from the norm. Yes. You said 8 to 10%, you become unconscious. Yes. And then a value of less than 8%, uh, death occurs. For most people, yes. Excuse me? For most people. And the normal oxygen saturation in adults and children is 95 to 100%? Yes. So if it decreases, the oxygen decreases less than 10%, someone would lose consciousness and die within less than 30 minutes. So that, that's hard to give a time frame on that. Um, studies that have been done shown that the oxygen you know, content is anywhere from four to six. Unconsciousness can occur in less than a minute, death within minutes. Um, but those have been empirical studies. So I, and I know that's, that's kind of, maybe you tell me, it's, that's kind of why you gave the... Uh, the two different diagnoses, the environmental and the uh, positional, is because the environmental may have had an effect or the positional may have had an effect. You just, you're not sure, so you listed them both? Not that I'm not sure. I think that both mechanisms were at play at the same time, and that's not unusual um, in deaths, is there can be multiple factors occurring at the same time. But you don't know the percentages, 50% for one or 70% for one, 30 for the other. You don't know. No. But you would agree in concert, if these two causes, the positional as well as the environmental, if they were acting in concert, uh, that would render a relatively short amount of survival time. I can't say. You just don't know. No. Now, you, we talked about these blunt force injuries, correct? Yes. Okay. Would it be fair to the jury to say that there were no broken bones? There were no broken bones. And it would be fair to say that the blunt force injuries on his body that the jury has seen here today had, did not contribute to the cause of his death? Not likely. 
And I, I think you didn't put that anywhere on your report. That it, no. did not. I included it in my report. Um, I did not include it on the death certificate. As the reason or cause, contributing cause of the death. Correct. Judge, can I, can I put up a couple of those yes, exhibits? Sir. Uh, doctor, are you aware that there was a baseball bat that was gathered uh, I didn't hear about that until later. When is later? When did you first learn about baseball? Uh, that might have been around the time that I was um, sitting for a deposition, but I can't quite remember. I don't have the file folder. I don't know when I was deposed. I'm going to show you this exhibit. This is uh, it's number 14. And it's a positive exhibit. It's state's exhibit. I believe number 13. This is picture number 14. You see, you see the, um, you said they were uh, <coughs> circular type injuries. Yes. And you've seen a regular baseball bat or a kid's baseball bat. Yes. A wooden bat. Um, and if, if you were to swing that bat and hit someone, hit somebody's body or hit a suitcase and the blunt force, that would be a linear line across that person. It could be depending on the position of the body, uh, the position of the suitcase, and the position or how the object came in contact. What is, what is linear, a linear injury? So a linear injury is if you think, you know, linear, it's more like a line. Okay. Now, if you took the barrel of the bat, the very end of the barrel of the bat, and you poked into the suitcase with the barrel of that bat, would those spots there in this is that consistent? That's compatible with that, yes. That's compatible. And then here's a close up just a picture. A picture of the fish game. Again, a close up. Same question. Uh, if, if, would that be consistent with poking uh, the suitcase, the keys in the suitcase at the time, thrusting the barrel of that bat, the crown of that bat? Potentially, that's those type Yes, it's compatible with that. Now, I want to draw your attention to the cardiovascular system. Have you, do you have your report? I do. Okay. You describe the prox. Small third of the left anterior descending coronary artery having greater than a 75% narrowing of the lumen due to its centrically placed firm yellow white fibrolipid atherosclerotic plaque? Yes. And is that pretty much verbatim with what you said in the report? Yes. And that terminology is synonymous with a single vessel high grade atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. Yes. And in that location, it's kind of a classic location for what people refer to as the widowmaker. Yes. Because of location in that vessel that supplies most of the circulation to the less left ventricle. Yes. If you had a spasm in that artery, that could nearly totally obstruct the lumen and cause a fatal heart attack, could it not? It could. It could cause a dysrhythmia, yes. I'm sorry? A dysrhythmia or an abnormal beating of the heart. But that could kill him. It could. The lumen is the inside space of the tubular structure? Yes. Of that, and so that was blocked over 75%. It was, but there was no evidence of... Um, myocardial scarring. So um, when the vessels become blocked, you prevent blood from getting to the muscle of the heart. So there was no evidence that there was any scarring. 
there was no evidence that there was anything that happened acutely. Um, when that happens, uh, we can see changes in the actual muscle of the heart. So there were no changes um, suggestive of that. Well, let me ask you something. If, if he were to get out of the suitcase on his own and he would have passed out or fell asleep on the couch and she would have woken up the next day about that time and came down um, and he, he was dead on the, on the couch um, and you did this autopsy, would it be fair to say that uh, in your ruling on cause of death, that, that single vessel coronary artery osteosclerosis would be your probable cause of death? It could be, but, you know, any sort of injury overrides natural disease if it, the injury is significant, right? So um, you don't have to be a perfectly healthy person to have trauma and die. So um, it's very common that we see people that have injuries for whatever reason, but also have a lot of natural disease. Um, but we look at as the injuries override the natural disease because especially atherosclerotic disease, that's, that's considered long-term, right? So that's been going on for years and years. People walk around with that all the time. So what's different is that we have trauma. And so that overrides natural disease. And sometimes natural disease can contribute, um, but again, it depends on the individual. It depends on, on the circumstances. So absent the positional asphyxia or the environmental asphyxia, um, and he was dead, and you did the autopsy. You, it would be fair to say that you would, you would determine this was a natural death from an isolated coronary heart, heart disease. Would you not? It would depend on the circumstances. And I can't speculate on this case because I know what I know about it. If you had nothing else, the widow maker would have caused his death. Or you would have to have assumed. Have not, having nothing else, that that would have caused his death? I most likely would have given him cardiovascular disease. Now, this ethanol metabolism that we talked about earlier, and there's a question about you believing he was in the elimination phase, correct? Yes. Okay. Is it fair to say that that... George Torres, the decedent, was in the elimination phase since the blood ethanol was below the vitreous value. Yes. Given the vitreous value was a 213, is it justified in saying the decedent's blood ethanol level was at least a 0.213 prior to starting the elimination phase? Yes. And now you know that the normal elimination rate is I, I believe a 0 0.015 percent per hour. Yes. Is that is that standard? It's it's an estimate. And so we have a difference of a 0 0.138 to the 213. So roughly five hours of elimination. Does that sound about right? Yes. So in other words, you would agree there's a short interval where the vitreous and the blood are identical. Yes. And then the blood drops beneath the vitreous value as ethanol is metabolized in the blood. Yes. So is it fair to say, given the significant difference in the blood and the vitreous ethanol values, that the true vitreous and blood ethanol level had to be much higher than what is reported in your report at, well, the, at the time that he passed? At the time that he passed? Yeah. No, this is reflective of the time that he passed. Say again? This is reflective of the 0.139. That's reflective of the time that he passed. There's not, you know, there's not um, metabolism after death okay. of the alcohol. All right. well, let, me, let, me, let me, what I'm saying is he could have been prior to that time of passing, he could have, his, his blood alcohol level would have been much higher. It was at least at the same level as the At vitreous. least the two, yes. at, least, at least the two one three. Yes. It could have been much higher. It could have been, yes. Judge, if I could approach the right. This is uh, defense composite exhibit for identification. Jay? Has the state seen it? Yes. <clears throat> we stipulate Jay into evidence was pre-marked as defense J, 
will be received into evidence without objection as defense one. You may. So that's the left hand. Uh, so you're looking at um, at the at the outer surface of the hand, the knuckles, and the three of the fingers. Yes. So that's the same, just a little bit farther away and without a scale. Here is picture number three. So now you're looking at the thumb and the index finger. And then shows some bruising on the hand. Yes. So what you're seeing here is, you know, from the scene, um, our investigators put brown bags over the decedent's hands. And that's, I mean, we collect evidence at the time of the autopsy. So at the scene, brown bags are put on the hands um, to preserve any evidence. And so that's why you're seeing this, because this is a picture that we take. We cut the bag open and we take a picture to show exactly what the hands look like. There's bruising here. Yes, there. Also around the knuckle area. Yes. Fingers also on the section here. Yes. And then here's the last picture. Which again is the left hand. Yes. Showing the bruising on the top of the hand as well as the knuckle area. Yes. Thank you, Any redirect examination? Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed. Um, you were asked um, uh, several questions on cross-examination about the alcohol level in this case. And uh, I believe uh, there was a term uh, metabolic phase or elimination phase. Uh, could you just explain for us um, what that is? Sure. So in the toxicology testing, there's two different levels that I ordered for levels of alcohol. One is they look in the blood to see the level of alcohol. The other is in what's called vitreous fluid or eye fluid. Um, and we look at both areas because that can give us an idea of whether somebody is metabolizing through the alcohol or whether it's still rising. It just gives us an idea sometimes of how close to death uh, they were when you know the ingestion of alcohol happened. But basically, the level in the eye fluid trails behind what we see in the blood. There will be a small point in time, as we discussed earlier, that they will be almost the same. But it, you can just think of it as the blood alcohol goes up and then a brief period of time later, the alcohol in the eye fluid will, will start to show. So again, it's just to give us an idea of whether somebody is metabolizing or whether they're still, um, you know, the level is still rising or if they're still, you know, intaking uh, alcohol. So the result uh, in this case was indicative that George Torres's level was uh, coming down. Yes. And I think some of the math was uh, a little bit difficult to, uh, to follow on, on the fly. Um, but with that rate of dissipation, uh, would it be fair to say that he would have been uh, in that suitcase for approximately five hours because he couldn't be drinking whilst in the in the suitcase that we're seeing this rate decrease between these two levels. Well, you have to be careful how you interpret it because you know the numbers that 
that I have from toxicology testing, that's from one point in time. I mean, that's we're collecting those specimens at the time of the autopsy. So that's only one point in time. It's possible, but I can't say for certain. All I can tell you is that at some point in time, his blood alcohol was at least the higher level that we saw in the vitreous fluid. Um, so if, you know, the the calculation of the five hours, that's an, that's an estimate because again, everyone's a little bit different, but I think it's reasonable to say five hours. Yes, that's at least, that's re within reason to say that. And obviously a pretty obvious point, but we don't continue to metabolize uh, alcohol after death. Correct. Um, you were asked about uh, studies or tests being uh, performed on the suitcase in this case. Correct. Um, would the presence of ob objects in that suitcase also affect um, the length of time a, a person may have survived in that suitcase? Um, I, I guess if there were a lot of other objects in there um, that maybe could, you know, occlude the mouth or nose, or maybe if that means that there's more, if there's more stuff in the suitcase, there's less room for the person. So I guess. Another variable <laughs> that would also be present would be uh, the opening of that zipper, would it not? Yes. So if the zipper was further open, potentially more oxygen could be uh, coming into that area. Uh, would that be fair to say? Yeah, there could be more oxygen coming in, but the, that's always the question is, you know, there was, it, would it be enough? Because I mean, you can still have oxygen there, but it may not be enough. I mean, again, for kind of the factors that, that I talked about before. And there would be no way to know exactly how far that zipper was potentially forced open. Correct. I have no further questions. Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Jill. All right, thank you, ma'am. Can the parties approach for a moment? Members of the jury, it's 11.01. We did get a bit of a later start this morning due to those security issues. Do any of y'all need to take a break at this point in time? Raise your hands if you do. All right, court seeing no hands. State, you may call your next witness. Yes, members of the jury, I have a matter I've got to take up with counsel outside of your presence. I promise it won't take too long. We'll bring you back in as quickly as possible. Again, same instruction I've given you previously. Please don't conduct any independent or investigation or research regarding the persons, places, things, or charge involved. And do not have any conversations among yourselves or anyone else about those things. We'll bring you back in as promptly as possible. Thank you. Y'all may be seated. Thank you. Judge, um, James Owens here, and I'm here with Sarah Boone, the first exhibit is uh, State's Exhibit F for identification. It is the uh, title Stipulation Victim Identification. It was signed by Mr. Patrick Corey, Sarah Boone, and myself, October 2nd, 2024. Okay. And the other stipulation? The other is a stipulation of FDLE report, again, signed by Dave Cacciatore Jr., Sarah Boone, and James Owens. It is a uh, it's listed as identification, identification statement to the end with a two-page FDLE laboratory report generated June 3rd of 2020. All 
Uh, can you approach with both of those documents, please? Thank you. State anything else to add over and above what Mr. Owens identified? No, Your Honor. All right. Ms. Boone, good morning. You were previously sworn earlier today. I hold in my hand two stipulations. The first stipulation pre-marked as State's Exhibit F reads stipulation of victim identification. Reads as follows. The Assistant State Attorney, Dave Cacciatore Jr., the defendant, Sarah Boone, as well as his lawyer, we have a Scrivener's error there, James Sylvian? Sullivan. Sullivan, okay. Sullivan Owens stipulate that the identity of the deceased in this case is George Torres. Signed the second day of October, 2024. Ma'am, have you had the opportunity to go over this stipulation with your attorney? Yes. Do you understand what this stipulation means? Yes. Are you freely and willingly entering into this stipulation? I am. Did anyone force you, threaten you, or coerce you to enter into this stipulation? No. All right. The court accepts this stipulation. How do we want to handle the little um, issue with regard to his lawyer as opposed to her lawyer? I'm fine with the... Uh court making an edit uh, to uh, scratch out his and insert her if that's acceptable. Acceptable? Yes. Ma'am, is that acceptable to you as well? It is. All right. Thank you. The court will make that handwritten interlineation, removing his and adding her. Um, State, do you seek, uh, we'll move this into evidence in front of the jury, correct? Correct. All right. Thank you, sir. Moving now to what was pre-marked to State's N. Ma'am, this is a stipulation of FDLE report. It reads, the assistant state attorney, Dave Cacciatore Jr. and defendant Sarah Boone, as well as his lawyer, James Sullivan Owens, stipulate to the admissibility into evidence at trial of the FDLE lab report authored by Carolina Benito on June 3, 2020. It bears... Mr. Cacciatore's signature, your signature, and the signature of your attorney, Mr. Owens. Have you had the opportunity to review this stipulation with your attorney? Yes. Have you had the opportunity to review the two-page FDLE report that will be attached to it? Yes. Do you understand what this stipulation means? Yes. Are you entering into this stipulation freely and voluntarily? Yes. Did anyone force you, threaten you, or coerce you to enter into this stipulation? No. All right, the court accepts this stipulation. Uh, any uh, issue with uh, striking through his and adding her state? No, Your Honor. Yes, sir. All right. The court will make that interlineation as well. Anything else we need to address, state, I will return these to you for the purposes of moving them into evidence with regard to these two, two stipulations. So nothing else? Nothing else. Okay, thank you. Defense, anything else? All right, thank you very much. Anything else we need to address before we bring back in our panel? No, sir. No, Your Honor. All right, let's go ahead and stand and bring back in our panel. Thank you.
Very entering. State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Yes. All right, members of the jury, thank you. You can be seated. <laughs> members of the jury, Ken, if you could just confirm that you complied with the court's instructions during that short break by raising your hands. Rec reflect that all juror members have raised their hands. State, you may proceed with your evidence and testimony presentation. Yes, Your Honor. At this time, we'd like to move what's been remarked for identification as states F and states N into evidence. Any objections? No, no objection. All right. What was pre-marked as states F will be received without objection as state 14. What's been pre-marked as states N will be received into evidence without objection as state 15. And Your Honor, we would uh, request that they be published. Thank you. Members of the jury, I'm gonna to read to you some stipulations along with an instruction. When the parties agree that certain facts are true, that is called a stipulation of fact. You must accept stipulated facts as having been proven. However, the significance of these facts, as with all facts, is for you to decide. In this case, the stipulated facts that you must accept as true are as follows. Stipulation of victim identification. The assistant state attorney, Dave Cacciatore Jr. and defendant, Sarah Boone, as well as, his, as her lawyer, James Sullivan Owens, stipulate that the identity of the deceased in this case is George Torres. Stipulation of FDLE report. The assistant state attorney, Dave Cacciatore Jr. and defendant, Sarah Boone, as well as her lawyer, James Sullivan Owens, stipulate to the admissibility into trial, I'm sorry, stipulate into evidence at trial of the FDLE lab report authored by Carolina Benito on June 3, 2020. With that, State, you can call your next witness. Meredith McCaskill. Hmm. I do. Ma'am, good morning. Could you please take a seat and state and spell your name for the record for us? My name is Meredith McCaskill, and it's spelled M-E-R-E-D-I-T-H-M-C-C-A-S-K-I-L-L. -L. Thank you. Mr. J, you may inquire. Thank you. Where do you work, ma'am? I am employed at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, the Orlando Regional Operations Center. And is that also called FDLE? Yes, it is. And what do you do for FDLE? I am a senior crime laboratory analyst in the biology DNA section. What is your educational background? And we'll get into training and experience as well, but what's your educational background that allows you to do that job? I have a Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences from Clemson University and a Master of Science in Biomedical Forensic Science from the Boston University School of Medicine. And when did you first start working for FDLE? I started at FDLE in April of 2011. Did you have any prior work experience uh, as a forensic uh, examiner of blood or biological or DNA evidence? No, I did not. So for the last 13 years, your experience has been with the FDLE? Yes, that's correct. And do you have any sort of in-house training and then continuing education that goes on as an employee at FDLE? 
Yes. Uh, so when you become a crime laboratory analyst, you have to successfully complete a training program. This training program takes about a year and a half to two years. It covers all of our policies and procedures and manuals, reading uh, textbooks and scientific articles, and performing a lot of in-house uh, testing and training under the supervision of a qualified analyst. There's also written and oral examinations, and you have to successfully complete every part of that in order to work cases as a crime laboratory analyst. And then every year we have continuing education. So that's education that we need to do in order to stay current with new uh, trends and technologies in the field. Does the lab itself enjoy any accreditations and what process, if so, does it go through to get them? Yes, FDLE is accredited by an organization called ANAB. It's the American National Standards Institute National Accreditation Board. Um, so we've been accredited for, I believe, over 30 years. It's a process where every four years they send people to come and inspect our lab, make sure that we're doing everything that we're supposed to be doing according to our policies and procedures. And then we're also following national standards that have been set down. That's every four years. It's very in-depth. And then we have additional kind of like spot checks every year just to make sure that we are maintaining everything that we are supposed to be doing. Have you ever given testimony in court about your opinion about sero serology uh, analysis or DNA analysis? Yes, I have. Approximately how many times? Approximately 35 to 40 times. Have you ever not been allowed to give opinion testimony in those areas? No, I have not. Can you tell us about the place, particularly within FDLE, tell us about your workspace and what personal protection equipment you may wear when you're doing DNA analysis? Yes. Uh, so in my workspace, I have what I call a clean side, which is where I keep all of my paperwork. And then I have my other side, which is used for actual screening of evidence items. So this is a surface where I can clean it with a detergent. I clean all of the um, implementate or instruments that I'm using. So scissors, uh, markers to take notes, anything like that is cleaned with a detergent, both before I start and after I finish. And it's cleaned and maintained in between every item of evidence. So only one item of evidence is open at a time, and this is to minimize any potential contamination. So DNA from one item getting into DNA from a second item. I also wear what is called personal protective equipment. This includes a lab coat, face mask, gloves, and potentially a hairnet, depending on what type of evidence that I'm working with. And then the, uh, the um, Gloves are disposable, so they are changed before and after each item of evidence. It's also changed if I have to touch my computer to take notes, I change my gloves. If I have to touch um, another surface, I change my gloves. So it's a lot of um, procedures that we use in order to prevent my DNA from getting onto the item of evidence. When DNA analysis is done, are instruments used to assist you in that process? Yes, we have um, an instrument uh, platform that we use that allows us to run the DNA in batches in a efficient manner. So there's multiple instruments that are used across the varying processes. And do these instruments generate paperwork that humans such as yourself can then go read and interpret? Yes, it does. Now, in this particular case, you are not the analyst who examined the items. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Did you review the information that is generated by the instruments used by the analyst who did this work um, in, in coming to your own conclusions? I was the technical reviewer on this file, so I reviewed all of the documentation and the paperwork and also the original analyst report. All right. Now, one of the items that is said to have been analyzed was a DNA card. Are you familiar with what that is? Yes, I am. Can you tell the jury what that is? Usually it's uh, referred to as a DNA card or a blood stain card. And that's just a card where somebody can spot uh, blood, usually human blood, on it and dry it down. Then uh, the analyst can take a cutting of that stained area in order to generate a DNA profile. And is that typically the manner in which a decedent or a dead person's DNA sample is provided to the lab for analysis? Yes, that's a very common thing that we see in decedents. And can you explain to the jury 
how it is an analyst such as yourself would take that blood stain on a portion of the DNA card and develop a DNA profile. Yes. So um, it usually is blood stained on the card. So you can identify that stain visually, take a cutting of that stained area and then place that cutting into a sterile tube, which is then sent through the DNA process. So that's adding chemicals and heat in order to break the cells open and release the DNA into the solution. And then running it through the rest of the procedures where we determine about how much DNA is in the sample make millions of copies of our specific areas of interest, and then generate a DNA profile that can be used for comparison to any questioned items in the case. Do you use some sort of commercial kit to uh, develop DNA profiles on known items such as this? Yes, we do. Approximately how many locations back in 2020 would have been tested on, on this DNA card? Uh, in 2020, it was 21 locations. And in going through this process, is there a process that amplifies uh, the amount of DNA? Yes, there is. Can you describe that? Yes. So we need to amplify or make millions of copies of the specific areas of interest that we're looking for. We don't want to make copies of the entire DNA molecule. We're just wanting to isolate those specific 21 areas and make copies of those specific areas in order to generate the DNA profile that we use in forensic DNA analysis. And you know what a short tandem repeat is? Yes, I do. What is that? Short tandem repeat, we also call them STRs. That's just the what we're looking for in the forensic DNA analysis. There are small short areas of repeating DNA pieces. So for example, at somebody's DNA profile at a specific location, you can have a set of 16 repeats and a set of 17 repeats. And that's just this one little piece of DNA and it repeats 16 times. And then you have a piece that repeats 17 times. And it's the number of repeats that is different from person to person. And you said you might be a 16 at one spot and 17. Let's just be clear um, what we're talking about. On one particular location, well, all of them, do you get DNA from mom and dad? Can you explain that? Yes. So you get DNA from your parents. So it's inherited. You get half of your DNA from your mom and half from your dad. So when I'm talking about the short tandem repeats and the example of a 16 and a 17, that could mean that you got a set of 16 repeats from one parent and a set of 17 repeats from the other parent. So it's just the copies that you get from your parents. And you might happen to have 16 from each. Yes, that's also a possibility. All right, and so the chemicals end up copying about, you said 21 areas in 2020? Yes, so there's 21, and then we look at several areas that are on the gender marker, so it was three areas on the gender markers. And each of these locations, We'll come up with some sort of number like 16, 17, 4, 4, so on and so forth. Yes, that's correct. Were you able, were, in reviewing the, the instrumentation data in this case, was the DNA profile that was said to have come from Mr. Torres, was there able to be a full DNA profile at those 21 locations developed? Yes, a complete profile was obtained for that sample. Now, can you tell us what a buckle or a buccal swab, sometimes people call it each, which way is the right way? I usually use the word buckle, but buccal is not incorrect either. All right. What is that? It's just a swab that we can use as a reference sample from a person. So it looks, all of our swabs just kind of look like a long Q-tip with one, only one end. And then you just take that cotton tip in and rub it on the interior of your mouth to um, get a good DNA sample. You have a lot of cells on the inside of your mouth and a lot of saliva. So that's a good source to use for a known sample from a person. And these long Q-tips, I believe, as you described, are they put into a box that is designed in a way so that the Q-tip doesn't touch the edges of the box? Uh, yes, I've seen it in boxes like that, but I have also seen it where they've been put back into the original um, uh, paper packet container. So either either method is fine. And did the FDLE in this particular case and the data that you reviewed, um, was there buckle swabs um, represented as being from the defendant, Sarah Boone? Yes, there was. And in the process that you briefly described for the jury already, can you can you just tell us if it's different in any way uh, to take a part of that cotton swab to develop a DNA profile than a piece of the DNA paper? 
No, it's the same process uh, with the buckle swabs. I'm just taking a small cutting of the cotton area of the swab, placing it in a tube and then running it through the exact same DNA process. And was a full profile of the 21 locations able to be developed for the uh, buckle swabs represented as being from Ms. Boone? Yes, a complete profile was obtained for that sample. Were there also what we call unknown samples that were examined in this case? Yes, there were. And you can, can you describe the difference between a known and an unknown sample for the jury? Yes, a known sample is a sample from a specific person. So that's like the example of a buckle swab. I know that sample came from that individual and I can use that as a way to determine that particular person's DNA profile. An unknown sample is just a sample where we don't know whose DNA or if there is any DNA on that sample at all. So those are questioned items that can be, uh, once a DNA profile is obtained from that item, can be compared to the known profiles obtained from individuals. And in this case, was there an unknown item labeled as DNA swabs representative coming from Mr. Torres's fingernails? I believe it was fingernail clippings yeah. from Mr. Torres, yes. All right. And typically, I know you didn't do the work on this particular case, but in reviewing the notes and in your experience, um, do these DNA samples from fingernail clippings come in as swabs, like a buckle swab? So sometimes they can come in as swabs, but other times they come in as just fingernail clippings. So taking the clippers and just cutting off the ends of the fingernails. And then I've also seen it where they've been scraped using um, pointed sticks. And so... If there is a swab that came in represented as being from the fingernails, then that would go through the process as you, as you previously described for the buckle swabs. Yes, that's correct. And if it comes in as fingernails or scrapings, do you all have to make your own swabs? Yes, that's correct. And how would you go about doing that? We have um, prepackaged swabs in our lab. We can then use um, some sterile deionized water and drip that onto the end of the cotton tip to make it a little bit moist so that it can pick up any DNA that is left on the item. And then we just swab the surface of the item, allow the swab to dry, and then cut it and place it into a tube for the DNA process. So we're just making our own swabs at that point. And was there a profile obtained from what was represented as being a DNA sample <laughs> from Mr. Torres's fingernail clippings? Yes, there was. And did it match either of the two known profiles that we've just discussed here this morning? Yes, it did. Which one? Mr. Torres. Were there any results indicating um, foreign DNA on this item? No, there were no DNA results foreign to Mr. Torres obtained from either set of fingernail clippings. Likewise, was there something examined in this case represented to be swabs or DNA samples from Ms. Boone, the defendant's fingernails. Yes, uh, those were swabs that were sent, uh, represented as being from her fingernails. And so just like the buckle swabs that come in as a Q-tip, and then you would test that in a similar manner? Yes, that's correct. Was a profile able to be developed from what was represented as being swabs from Ms. Boone's fingernail? Yes, there was. And did that profile match either of the two known profiles that we've been discussing this morning? Yes, it did. And whose was that? Ms. Boone's. Now, in regards to both of these last items that we've talked about, the fingernail swabs um, from each Mr. Torres and Ms. Boone, is it, is, is it expected that their profile would be uh, developed from DNA swabs from their fingernails? Yes, it is. Both are, all of those samples were represented as being from those particular individuals. So their DNA is expected to be on those items. Was there any DNA foreign to Ms. Boone uh, on those samples that were representative as, as coming from her fingernails? No, there were no DNA results foreign to Ms. Boone obtained from either set of fingernail swabs. Now with this amplification process that you described, is it PCR? Yes, it is. Um, how sensitive is it when um, you know, a sample is taken from an unknown area such as fingernails? The PCR process is pretty sensitive, um, and over the years, as the science has evolved and testing has changed, the process has become even more sensitive over the years. And hypothetically, if, if two people are living together and are intimate partners, quite frankly, would you expect uh, the intimate partner's DNA to show up on swabbings from their fingernails? Uh, yes, it's possible that their DNA would show up if they're in close contact with each other. But in this particular case, 
after uh, reviewing all of the instrumentation data, there was no DNA foreign to either of their fingernail clippers, both clippings or swabs from their fingernails, both Mr. Torres and Ms. Blue. Yes, that's correct. No other questions. Any cross-examination? Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Once you develop a profile, are you able to take that profile and compare it to other possible uh, DNA on objects or items? Well, if it's a DNA profile that is obtained from a questioned item, we can compare that to profiles from known individuals. And in this case, an example of that, if an object um, from an unknown source, you could take that and compare it to a known profile. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And if you get a match in with that comparison, what can you take from that? Um, just that that is the DNA profiles are the same. So if it's an object, let's say like a bat, and there's a D DNA profile that's obtained from the bat, and it matches a known profile, could you make the conclusion that the that person touched or handled that bat from the known profile? No, I can't. There's nothing in the testing that we do at FDLE that will allow it, me to determine how any DNA ended up on an object or how long it's been on that object. Now, you said that in this case, what was sent for DNA comparison? In this case, there were there was a bloodstain card or a DNA card represented as being from Mr. Torres. Buckle swabs represented as being from Miss Boone. Fingernail clippings uh, from both hands represented as being from Mr. Torres. And then fingernail swabs from both hands represented as being from Miss Boone. Those are the only items that were sent to your lab for comparison. Those were the only items sent to the DNA lab, yes. Thank you, ma'am. I have no further questions. Any redirect examination? No redirect. She can be excused as far as the state is concerned. Defense? Yes. All right, ma'am, you're excused. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. State, you may call your next witness. You know a lot Ma'am, good morning. If you could take a seat, state your name and spell it for the record, please. Uh, first name is Janella, J U N E L L A. Last name is Wadden, U A D is in Delta A N. May I please support? You may proceed, sir. Where do you work, ma'am? I'm currently employed with the Orange County Sheriff's Office here in Orlando, Florida. What is Sheriff Mina currently having you do? I'm currently, um, my current position is a digital forensic examiner. And how long have you held that position? Uh, I just hit six years. And can you tell us about, and we're going to break it down, education, training, and experience. Let's just talk about your education. What's your educational background prior to becoming a law enforcement officer? In particular, what is relevant to being a digital forensic examiner? Um, I actually started um, in... Um, crime scene investigations with the sheriff's office. So I have a bachelor's in um, forensic science through the University of Central Florida. Um, upon transferring over to our digital forensics unit, I 
um, became a certified computer forensic examiner through the International Association of Computer Investigative Specialists. IACIS? ISIS, yes. Call it ISIS? Yes. No, mm. <laughs> How do you say it? IASIS. IASIS. All right. I just want to shorten it. Yes. All right. So IASIS. Tell us about that program that you went through with IASIS uh, to become a digital forensics examiner. Yes. The beginning portion of it is in-classroom training. Um, it's normally only hosted in two different locations around the world, one being here in Orlando, the other one normally being somewhere over in Europe. They actually just expanded a third location over in Australia. Um, so again, the first first two weeks are in classroom training, normally with over 300 other um, students. Uh, and then the next um, five to six months are all a peer review um, type training where they give you problem sets on how to, it goes from basic education on computer forensics to how to recover um, data, could be pictures, could be videos, you're not, you're not sure until you um, pass one step to move on to the next one to figure out what you're um, essentially what kind of uh, questions you're going to get. All right. We'll take a break from the education training experience for one second. On February 23rd, 2020, were you called out to a scene? Yes. Does that happen from time to time as a digital forensic examiner as opposed to your previous duties like CSI, which would always go to the scene? Yes, as a digital forensic examiner, we are required to come out on scenes if requested. May I approach the witness with e for identification? You may. Showing you e for identification, do you recognize states e for identification? Yes. And how is it that you recognize that? Um, I recognize the um, front label or the portion filled out on the envelope with um, my handwriting, as well as um, evidence tape sealed, um, also initialed with my initials. And um, the information on it includes like your case number and some of the other information that you just answered? Yes, case number, date of collection, and the item description. And what is said to be contained inside of that envelope? Uh, an Apple iPhone uh, model XS. Um, with a pink case. All right, and if I am not incorrect, I believe there's two sets of evidence tape on that item? Yes. Can you tell us about each set? Uh, the first set, which is the red, red tape here, um, initially when I collect or sometimes when we receive items from crime scene investigators, um, the packaging necessarily doesn't have to be sealed just because the phone might have to be kept charge on prior to us receiving the phone. Um, so in this case, I did collect the item from the, the residents. Um, I brought it back to our office. Um, and then once I was done with my exam, it later gets sealed, um, again, with my initials and dates. And if there's a um, later on an evidence review or somebody needs to review um, the item again, if we need to do an additional examination, the package might be reopened and then resealed again, hence the um, blue tape here at the bottom. All right, other than the blue tape, is that item and the, the packaging substantially in the same condition when you were done examining what is said to be contained inside? Yes. May I approach the witness? You may. If you would, could you open up this package and without showing it to the jury at this point, see if you recognize what's inside of the envelope? Yeah. Yes, there's a phone with a pink case inside. Do you recognize that as the item that you collected from the scene that you went to on February 23rd, 2020, and then later examined? Yes. All right. So this scene, February 23rd, 2020, where is this scene? Uh, I believe it's 4740. Or can I refer to my report for the, the address or the numerical? It would refresh your memory. Yes. Go ahead. And then when you're done refreshing memory, let us know if your memory was refreshed. Yes, 
be Recovery refreshed. Yes. What is your answer? Um, 4748 Franz. Not sure if I'm saying that correct. Uh, court uh, number apartment number three. Now, I know you work for the sheriff's office in Orange County, but I still need to ask, is this in Orange County, Florida? Yes. All right. Now, you collected that item. Um, may I move E for identification and evidence at this time? Any objections? No objection. It was pre-marked as E will be received into evidence without objection, Estate 16. <coughs> Did you do anything with that item while you were on scene? Yes. What is it that you did with that item while you were on scene? Um, I was requested to come out. I was informed from the detectives that um, the user of the device gave consent for us to download her phone. Um, so I responded out. And um, once I located the phone, I immediately started to um, extract uh, extract the data from, from the phone. All right. So now let's talk about what tools you use to do that. I assume there's some software involved with this process. Yes. Can you tell us about your familiarity and the training that you had in regards to using that software back in the time of February 2020? Yes. Um, one of the main tools that we use for data extraction is called Cellbrite. Um, I did obtain, again, transitioning to our digital forensics unit, I obtained um, two certificates with Cellbrite, which is an operator certificate knowing how to operate the hardware um, and the extraction software, as well as a certificate in um, their physical analyzer software, which is more used for the analysis part. So once we download the phone, we get a digital file, which to us is a lot, a lot of data, which humans, we can't read. Um, so their, their software basically makes it more readable for us humans, which we can then generate a report in different formats um, for, for review. Um, so in this case, we used Cellbrite. Um, they actually started to develop software for cell phone companies. So if you remember back in the day when you went to go upgrade your phone and you had to go into a brick and mortar store, um, they actually had the software to help transfer your old data from your old phone and transfer it to your um, new phone, like your contacts, your pictures, your videos, um, a lot of the data that you didn't want to want to lose when upgrading upgrading your phone. Um, but they are now a predominantly digital forensics company, and they provide the software that we use to extract um, data off of digital digital devices. And is there any hardware involved to use this software? Yes. Tell us um, about that. Yes, in this case, um, and especially at that time, we have we had two options. There was a portable tablet. Um, in this case, I used a. You can still use a computer, um, and they have sister software that mirrors the exact same software that's on the portable tablet. Um, so in this case, I had my call-out laptop um, with the um, extraction software installed on it. And just like you would to connect your phone to, let's say, your computer to export photos or train, um, take photos off of your phone if you want to save them, we're doing essentially the exact same thing in the field where we're connecting it to our, our computer and we're letting the software pull, pull all that data or the contents off of that phone. When you were told that um, you had Ms. Boone's password to her phone device, do you do anything to try and make sure that the data cannot be manipulated or destroyed from the outside world? Yes, it's standard protocol. Like once we receive a phone, um, hopefully mm -hmm. somebody did it before it's handed to us. Um, but again, if we're responding out to the scene or we're the only ones that are interacting um, with the phone, we for sure try to, if we are given a passcode, we try to confirm the passcode. Um, and then the phone is immediately put into airplane mode, um, which will disconnect it from any outside network. And we also try to ensure, because not always, um, once you place your phone into airplane mode, it doesn't always turn off your Bluetooth and or Wi-Fi connections. Um, so we may go in and make sure that those settings are also disabled before we extract, extract the data. All right. Take us through this extraction process. I understand that there are many different levels of information that you can get, depending on a lot of things that you'll tell us about. Um, can you tell us the level of extraction we were able to do on site with this cellular phone device? 
Yes, for this specific phone, um, we were trying to minimally get the user data. Again, the stuff that you got, you guys can see when you're looking through your phone, your calls, your messages, your pictures, um, your videos. Um, and in this case, that's the level of support that the, so the on-scene software that we're able to use is able to download um, from the phone, um, especially with, with having a um, password or passcode. All right. So I think we're all familiar with Windows. I think Mac has its own special iOS operating system as well. Can you tell us about the operating system that was on this particular cellular phone device? Uh, yes, Apple um, has its own operating system, um, iOS, if you have an iPhone. And of course, if even if you have Android or Apple, you're constantly getting notifications saying it's time to update your phone to the newest software. Um, so in this case, it's an iPhone, so it's running a, a, their shortened version of iOS. Can you also extract data that has been quote unquote deleted from the operating system? Can you just tell us all about it? Uh, yes, it is sometimes a possibility. Um, it's not always guaranteed, um, but we sometimes have more advanced tools that can pull, potentially pull that, that data from, from the device. And then later, once we get that download, we can put it into that software and normally will uh, give us indications on whether or not data has been, been deleted. And so if a particular photograph or a Word document or some sort of file has been deleted from the operating system, may it still remain on the phone device or computer device? Yes. It may still be uh, locatable with your software tools. That, that is the hope. Again, not always guaranteed, but um, again, that's why we're, we're trying to go in there and look, look for that, um, the data behind, behind the scenes to see if we can recover um, those, those artifacts, yes. Did you later do another extraction of this phone device back in the office? Yes. And tell us if it is different in any way, how your software or hardware was different in doing it at the office. Yes, in this case, the we use, again, a more advanced tool, um, which is able to capture, the technical term is a full file system. Um, so we're capture, capturing that whole um, filing cabinet, you would say, of the data stored on the phone. Um, with, again, the probability to not only collect possibly deleted data, but also your systems um, information, application data, like your social media, um, mes messaging apps, everything aside from your normal um, user data, uh, like, again, like your calls and messages and pictures and videos. What level of capture, you answered it now, I'm sorry. What level of capture were you able to do? Uh, again, in this case, I was able to do the full file system back at the office um, on scene. It's the technical term is an advanced logical or logical extraction, again, which is, which encompasses your generic user user data on your phone. And the level of extraction you did at the office, is that encompass data that's outside of the operating system or in unallocated space? It can include that data, yes. Now, what kind of information can be generated by this computer software tool that you used uh, to make it presentable for a human such as yourself or the members of the jury to review? Yeah, in the software, um, it will place um, the data in data categories. So it's organized. We can, if we just want to search between mess messages, we can go in the messages category. Um, if we want to look at logs, like maybe data that your phone's recording, um, like locations, um, app activity, um, that's also presented in its own dat data category. And it also has the ability to um, put all that data in chronological order in a what they refer to as a timeline. Um, so we can also see all that ongoing data um, in the timeline section. And if we need to, we can either narrow down to a small scope of time, or if it's requested, we can give the whole, all the data, all in that timeline to whoever wants to review it. And for instance, if there's an entry on the timeline that says, you know, April 1st, 2016, uh, photograph ABC was taken. Um, are there separate folders that are generated by the software tool that has all the images such as that still photograph um, generated? 
Uh, yes, when we export it um, or generate like in a PDF version of that report, all that data is categorized in a PDF, but it also exports a copy um, of that same data, such as images and videos in separate subfolders. So if I just wanted to go look at um, the pictures from the phone directly, I could just go into that subfolder and just look at all thousands of images that might be exported from the phone. And um, is there identifying information such as an IMEI um, that is generated by the software tool? And can you tell us what these things are? Yes, the IMEI is um, one identifier that your, your cell phone has to help authenticate it to um, your cell phone network. It also is like a serial number um, unique to your phone. Um, and in this case, um, our software is able to um, read and report all those um, device identifiers from, from your phone, including an IMEI. And do you take actual photographs of the cellular phone device, like the exhibit we just put into evidence um, to document it while you, before or after you do the extraction? Yes, just like in crime scene, uh, cell phone digital evidence is essentially another form of evidence. So um, we always try to document the current state, condition, um, whether it's locked, unlocked. And if we, again, in this case, we did, we were provided a passcode. So I normally like to um, photographically document um, the phone's identifiers or um, accounts um, that may be logged in, logged into the phone. Prior to trial, were you asked um, to look at two different exhibits uh, to see if they represented a portion of that timeline you described that can be put into the PDF report form, as well as some of the images and videos um, from this extraction that you performed on the device that's in evidence? Yes. May I approach? May. What I'm showing you first is O for identification. Did you have an opportunity to review that this morning to make sure that the portion of the PDF and the images uh, in a separate folder there were part of the extraction that you did on this device that we're talking about? Yes. And was that accurate? Yes. P for identification, is that another carve out of the PDF timeline as well as videos and photographs from that device? Yes. All right, this time the state will move O for identification into evidence and reserve on With regard to states O. No objection. All right, what was pre-marked as states O will be received into evidence without objection as state 17. Permission to publish? You may. Open up the file labeled extraction. All right, so sorry about your neck. <laughs> Looking at entry 31079, can we just go column through column and explain what we're looking at? Uh, yes, the first column normally is just an assigned number, just um, like a line item number for the report. Because again, this is an excerpt. Um, there could be thousands and thousands of line items when you're looking at the entire timeline. Um, so the far left-hand column is just a line item number. 
um, followed by a, again, the data, data category for whatever data you're looking at. Um, in this case, there's, there's a couple listed as application usage and then location, location data. Um, Let's talk about the column that has dates and times, and can you explain to us what UTC minus five means? Yes. Um, another column, again, we're putting, looking this at a timeline, so we want to know dates and times. So we'll include the date and time of the data that was recorded onto the phone. Um, and this report was adjusted for our local Eastern Standard Time here in Orlando, Florida, so UTC um, negative five. And going up to the top line there, 31075, that indicates that there is a start time for the application com.apple.camera. And then going back to our original one, 31079, that's the end time. Can you tell us what that means? Yes. So Apple is very good about recording um, activity on the direct, directly from your device. Um, when you open up a certain application, such as the camera, um, Apple is making note that you... In this case, it's in indicating a start time. So you opened up your camera at um, 10, 21, 36 p.m. Um, and then you stopped using it, maybe maybe closed it out or stopped recording um, at 10, 21, 38 p.m. And in this portion of the PDF uh, timeline, there does not appear to have been any videos or photographs captured while the camera was open. Is that accurate? Uh, based on that excerpt, I don't see a recorded media file. All right. In the surrounding entries, can we just talk about what I would unfairly probably call spam of locations? What is going on there? Um, again, if there's uh, usage, um, application usage, or um, you're just in a really good location, or your device is just set to record um, locations wherever you are, um, your phone is also recording that, that data as well. And in some some cases, like again, your your phone, if you have it set for your camera to record um, uh, your location when you take a picture, um, again, like when you reopen that picture, it'll show you, hey, you were located at you know twenty five hundred West Colonial Drive. Um, that's that data that's being recorded in the background while you're using that application that it might have that permission to record um, that data. <laughs> Can we just go column by column through the first entry here, 16498? What does instant messages mean? Uh, that's referencing um, text, text messages. Second column, outgoing. Does that indicate there's an outgoing communication? Yeah, so it'll, it'll reflect outgoing or incoming depending on the recipient or sender. The next column, there's a one. What does that mean? Uh, that just might be like one, one S entry, one message. Um, I don't see the the header for the the okay. columns that one I'm not specific um I'm sure of. All right, and the date and time we've already explained. Let's talk about the from paren owner and then the participants. What does this all mean? Um, so the from section again, if we're looking at the first first row of data, um, it's indicative that it's a text message because the uh, sender it's listing the phone number being used to send that message, um, and then. For iPhone devices specifically, if you're communicating with another Apple device, it may also list um, the phone number as well as um, your backup, which is your Apple ID. So if it can't transmit that message through your phone number, it might default to your um, iCloud account. Yeah. And in this case, it's listing, listing, listing both. All right. And if, for instance, the, the outgoing recipient or the incoming sender of the text message is in the contacts, would it show up with the person's name, such as Wancho? Yes, our software will display um, your uh, contact name as, as how you save it. And if there's no contact name, it would just show the phone number? Phone number or, um, again, Apple, your iCloud account. Videos of 16499, capture time, what does that indicate? Um, so that is when the uh, video, in this case, it looks like a video is captured on, on the device.
let's specifically talk about entry 16520. Again, we've discussed that's an instant message and it's incoming rather than outgoing. So that means it came to this phone device. Yes. And over to the right of the date and time, which would have been 6.07 p.m. 30 seconds on Christmas 2019, it indicates that it's from a contact named Mo. Is that accurate? Yes. Then the contents speak for itself. Um, going down to 16522, an outgoing instant message at 11.31 p.m. 57 seconds on Christmas 2019. What is the content of that communication? Uh, the content of the message is hide and seek. I shall. Turning down to 17167, it's an instant message that indicates it's outgoing from this device on January 13th, 2020, 5.01 p.m., 41 seconds, and it's from what is a brand owner. Does that mean it's from the device? Yes. What's the content of that text message? Sorry, what was the line, up, line on that number? 17167. Uh, and bless you and all of you too. I'll get rid of him. Then the next three are also outgoing messages. What do they indicate as, as far as content? Uh, starting with 17168, then I'll be better, followed by 17169, UG, and 17170, uh, Torres. <laughs> Turning now to entry 31103, which is on page 49 of the 59 page PDF. Um, again, it looks like what we talked about before the com.apple.camera application gets opened up to be used at 11, 12 p.m. 40 seconds. Is that what this data reflects? Yes. And then at entry 31107, a video that ends up being captured as IMG underscore 1062 dot mov uh, begins at 11 12 p.m 45 seconds on february 23rd 2020 is that accurate yes and then there does not seem to be any intervening closing of the camera application before we get to three one 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 three in that portion, I don't, I don't see that um, information. And then at 11.23 p.m., 03 seconds on February 23rd, 2020, in entry 31113, a second movie is generated by this device labeled IMG underscore 1063.mov. Yes. I'm gonna continue publishing on this exhibit. For everything you've done to me. For everything you've done to me. 
Fuck you. Fallow. Fuck you. Fallow. <laughs> Stupid. Fallow. This is my name. The word on. I can't fucking breathe, babe. Therapy. Yeah, that's when you do when you choke me. Therapy. Sarah. Sarah. Sarah, I can't breathe, babe. That's on you. Sarah, I can't breathe. <laughs> That's on you. Sarah. Real or ransom? Might want to give it for it extra. Because <laughs> I got this. Terrible. Real or Terrible. I can't believe they. Oh. That's what Terrible. I feel like when you cheat on me. Terrible. Fuck I you. You should probably shut the fuck up. For the record, that was IMG underscore 1062.mov, now publishing 1063, same respective file name. Ah. No other questions of this witness? Any cross-examination. Good afternoon, ma'am. I believe you stated on direct that you were called to the scene and you were asked to do your analysis out there. Is that correct? Uh, at least a download. download. Um, what type of phone? What's this? An Apple iPhone XS. And how were you able to um, get into the phone? The lack of a better word. Uh, I was provided with the um, phone's passcode. Okay. Uh, with an Apple phone, without being given that passcode, are you able to get in an Apple phone? Maybe not necessarily unlock the phone, even though that is an option through some of our advanced tools that is supported. Um, but it can have the ability to download the phone even in a locked state and pull 80, 85% of that data. Is a much easier process when you have the code? It's quicker, yes. And how were you provided that code? Um, I believe either through um, Detective Copsel or Connolly at the time, um, or I may have um, asked Ms. Boone just to reconfirm the passcode. And did she give you the passcode? Yes, yeah, somebody did, yes. Now, on the first exhibit that went up, or when you're talking about the communications or the identifying factors of the phone, uh, one of the things that were identified is dates and times. Is that correct? Yes. Right. Also, you said it would tell you if the source was incoming or outgoing. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And then you said it would identify, it could identify either by phone number or name. Is that correct? Yes. All right. On the, on the examples that you gave us, who was the identifying name? as to the outgoing on this phone. Sorry, can you repeat the question? 
who is the identifying name for the outgoing uh, tax or calls on this phone? Um, I think in some of the line items that were shown above, it was just listed as a phone, a phone number. Was there ever a name listed? A physical name, um, possibly in other, other line items. But in this, and again, in those excerpts, it's just by phone number. Okay. Uh, did you ever see the name Brian Boone? Yes. Okay. Where did you see the name Brian Boone? I believe in one of the iCloud or log accounts that was logged into the phone. Um, there was an associated email address. On any, on any, no, taking that, was it any other place where you would see in a different name as to the outgoing? Uh, other than Brian Boone. Uh, again, there there might have been other names listed in other portions of it. But again, in those excerpts, it was just either by phone number or, um, again, with the Apple iPhone listing, the um, I, iCloud account. Do you have a copy of the exhibit out there? Uh, no, not, not on me. Can we get that? Are you able to see that? And no, this monitor is this monitor is not working. May we approach? Yes. Maybe approach. Yes.
Pam, were you able to see that? Yes. There's a entry on 12 25 2019. Is that correct? Uh, in, are you referencing like the instant message, the instant message row? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, does it, as far as participants, what does that show you? What does it tell you? So it's listening, listing the, um, the owner in reference to the, we'll say the first phone number, um, 8684. It's referencing that phone number as well as um, the Gmail account or iCloud account associated with the phone. And then it's listing a physical name of Brian, Brian Boone. Okay, so it's showing Brian Boone as being the owner of the phone. Is that correct? Uh, for that phone number and or one of the participants in that message conversation. Uh, have you... Did you recall seeing any other not any other name associated with that phone number um, other than Brian Boone? I'm not sure I'm understanding the the question. All right, when you did the uh, analysts of this, and you would look for the participants and get that information, match it up with the phone number. Uh, then in certain cases, they will show you the owner name because you said Apple is very detailed in some of their yes. applications. So would you did you ever see another name associated with this account other than Brian Boone? Uh, there, there was another iCloud account logged in on the physical phone. Okay. There was no like um, name name attached. There was no name attached. Oh, bless you. Now, when you're, when you're identifying these sources as being either outgoing or incoming sources, and is that basically telling you what device is being used? No, it does. It's not indicative of a specific device other than we know outgoing. Um, the sort, Obviously, the source is the, the phone that we extracted that data from. In, incoming messages, it does not let us know if it if the message was made through a Samsung Galaxy or another iPhone. Okay. What identifying information do you get at that time? In regards to like receiving a message? Yes. Um, in this case or what's displayed there, it's going to give us the content of the message. It's going to give us the date and time that the message was sent or received. Um, and again, like in your phone, it does depict either through a small notification arrows indicating ingoing or outgoing. So it's just displaying that version in text up there. Okay. And, then, and then from there, um, it's basically telling you the number uh, that it came from. Is that correct? Yes, like in reference to that top row, it's saying that that message um, came from that phone number, uh, Again, the top line item, last four digits is 8684. Um, and then it's also listing the message participants. It's not telling you the person who sent the message. Is it? Correct. Just, the, just that it's originating from a phone number. So if two people or more people had access to a phone, you wouldn't, from this information, you wouldn't be able to tell who actually sent the message on any given time. Is that correct? No, I'm not a fly on the wall, and I can't see who's physically typing typing out messages. Thank you, ma'am. No further questions. Any redirect examination? Other than just your subjective interpretation given the context of conversations. Yes. And if photographs or videos are taken during these conversations, that could be indicative of who is behind the phone device as well. Based on sound and visuals, that it is a it does help. Thank you. Can this witness be released? As far as the state is concerned, yes, sir. Yes, you're wrong. All right, ma'am, you're released. Thank you very much. Thank you. State any other witnesses or evidence to call at this time? Not for the morning presentation. Okay. All right. Members of our jury, it is 1221. At this point in time, we're going to go ahead and take our lunch break. I'm going to ask you to report back here at 2 o'clock at 12A, the Orange County Courthouse. I'm going to give you a similar instruction, the same instruction I read to you last week. Jurors, you must not conduct any investigation on your own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, or using a computer, cell phone, the internet, any electronic device, or any other means at all to get information related to this case 
or the people and places involved in this case. This applies whether you are in the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in the trial or use the internet to look at maps or pictures to see any place discussed during the trial. Jurors do not watch local news or read local newspapers. Jurors must not have discussions of any sort with friends, family members, or even your fellow jurors about the case or the people and places involved. So do not let anyone make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. I want to stress again that just as you must not talk about this case face to face, you must not talk about this case by using an electronic device. You must not use phones, computers, or other electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept any messages related to this case or your jury service. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all, including posting information on an internet website, chat room, or blog. With that, members of the jury, we'll be in recess. We'll see you back here at two o'clock this afternoon. I thank you for your time. <laughs>
I mean, it, it sounds like that's what Mr. Owens' intent is for the purposes of submitting evidence. The one reason I would suggest not introducing USBs is because they're rewritable and they can be manipulated and destroyed by the jury or uh, not that anybody would do it intentionally, parts of the court. Uh, any, any sort of issues can happen when something is not blocked and put onto a physical burnt piece of wax. Mr. Owens? We'll, we'll see what we can do here locally. There's a FedEx. I don't know if they would be able to do that. The uh, FedEx is a block away. We'll check with them at lunch. I would check with them. I, I, I agree with the state's concerns as to manipulation or editing of anything that may be contained in a USB drive. Not to say that that's going to happen, but it certainly preserves the evidence moving forward rather than it being in a um, editable form, be it in a USB drive. We'll go talk. All right, very good. Okay, thank you all very much. We'll see you at two o'clock. Court's off the record. We are back on the record. Case number 2020 CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. Let me get appearances for the state. Dave on behalf of the state. William Jackson State. Defense. James Owens for Sarah Boone. Tony Henderson for Sarah Boone. All right, Mr. Beck is not with us. Okay. Uh, Ms. Boone is still seated at counsel's table wearing the same clothing that she had on this morning. She is in custody, however, out of any restraints. Uh, so we will be standing when our jury enters and exits. It's 204. State, are you ready to proceed? Yes. All right. Thank you all for letting me know the lay of the land with regard to those specific issues. Um, we're going to bring our jury in momentarily and inquire to staying after five o'clock. Um, members of the gallery, good afternoon. The state is going to continue with their evidence presentation. Uh, I know this morning some cell phones were going off or there was chattering in some cell phones this morning. I'm going to please respectfully request that you turn off your cell phones uh, and not have any correspondence or communications orally amongst yourselves or anyone else in the gallery. I'm not going to allow any outbursts. If you cannot contain yourself, I'm going to ask you now to remove yourself. This is your one and only opportunity. If you cannot control yourself or there are outbursts, I will ask the courtroom deputy to remove you. Does anyone have any questions with, the court, with regard to the court's instructions? If you're wearing sunglasses, I need you to remove them. Thank you. All right, with that, state anything we need to address before we bring in our panel? One more thing. Yes, sir. May we yes. All right. Thank you all for your patience. Um, Ma'am in the back left, last row, good afternoon. After conversing with the state and the defense, they've agreed and asked me to excuse you from this room. I understand that there may have been an outburst by you with courtroom personnel before the judge arrived on the bench this afternoon. If you would like to watch the trial, it is being streamed live. You can head to the 12th floor, get off the elevator, and head to the um, south side of the building. See the sign where it says Judge Michael Cranick. It'll tell you which direction to go. You can pick up the phone, call my judicial assistant, Anita Berrios, and she can give you instructions on how to watch this trial virtually. Okay? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Well, I do it anyway. Okay, I appreciate you guys. I'm still the boss of the city, so we got to work together and try to figure it out. Thank so, you, ma'am. Yeah, y'all heard what I said. It's John Have a good one. Thank you. Okay. To restate the court's prior positions, if there's anyone going to have any outbursts or cannot control themselves, again, I'm going to ask you to remove yourselves at this time. State, are we ready to bring in our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, are we ready to bring in our jury? Yes, sir. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our panel. State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? All right, thank you. Y'all can be seated. Members of the jury, good afternoon. I hope that you enjoyed uh, your lunch break. Welcome back. Um, we're going to pick up with the evidence and testimony presentation by the state this afternoon. We may have to work after five o'clock, possibly between 5.30 and six. As I recall with speaking with some of you, you have minor children and may need um, childcare to pick them up. 
Is there anyone here who has any concerns with regard to childcare staying till between 5.30 and 6? If you have those concerns, okay, juror in first row, uh, third seat from the right. Yes, ma'am. As long as we get a break between now and then and I can call someone, I should be fine. I would absolutely give you that opportunity right now to do that. Oh, okay. Is there anyone else who has concerns about child care? If you're able to have child care, ma'am, is that going to affect your ability to listen to the evidence this, this afternoon? Okay. Can the parties approach for a moment? All right, ma'am, just you, not everybody. If you could step out back to the deliberation room and make those phone calls, take your time. And once you come back in, we'll pick up from there and just let me know if you're able to get coverage. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. If you can, members of our panel, show me by a show of hands you comply to the court's instructions prior to the lunch hour. All right, record reflect all hands have been raised. With that, state you can call your next witness. State you call Chelsea Castle. And good afternoon. Could you state and spell your name for the record for us? Yes. Chelsea Capsule. C H E L S E Y K O E P S E L L. Thank you. You may inquire. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hello. Who do you work for? The Orange County Sheriff's Office. And what is your position with the Orange County Sheriff's Office? I am currently a homicide cold case detective. How long have you worked for the Orange County Sheriff's Office? Since April of 2013. And what positions have you held at the Orange County Sheriff's Office in, during that time? Um, so I began my career in uniform patrol, and then I uh, moved on to the sex crimes unit as a detective, and then I moved on to the homicide unit as a detective. In the homicide unit, um, tell us, what are your duties as a homicide detective? Um, to respond to, obviously, homicides and any death-related um, incidents. And what type of training do you need uh, to hold that position? Um, so I went to the police academy, and then after um, going to the police academy, I became a deputy. And then um, basically just having experience from other units and taking like uh, homicide courses and um, investigative courses to help me. Is continuing training a condition of not only your employment, but also holding your position in the homicide unit? Yes. Um, how is it that you became involved in this case? So on February 24th of 2020, um, my partner at the time, Detective Scott Lowen, received a call. Um, our team um, in the homicide unit, there's three uh, teams that have um, four detectives on each team with a supervisor. And then we have one sergeant. And so um, on that date, um, Detective Scott Lowen was basically screening calls for that day. And um, we were at the office and he told me about the call. Are all homicide investigations worked in tandem with another detective? Uh, typically, yeah. We normally always have a partner with us. Can you tell us why is it that we do that? Um, well, honestly, it's more for court purposes if I weren't to be able to be in court. Um, but it's also nice to just have someone else's perspective um, and training. Um, we all come from different backgrounds, so it just kind of helps the investigation. Once, uh, once you received a uh, call on this case, where was the first place that yourself and Detective Lowen went to? We responded to the scene. And when you say the scene, is that 4748 France Court? Yes, I believe so. And when you responded to the scene, uh, who did you make contact with first? Uh, the first person I made contact with was uh, Deputy Kayla Rodriguez. And was Deputy Rodriguez able to uh, convey you certain information at that time? Yes, yeah, she explained to me um, what had been said to her and basically what they have done. 
And this location uh, that you responded to, uh, was the defendant present there at that time as well? Yes, she was. She was outside. And did you make contact with her? Yes, I did. During that time that you were initially there at the scene, um, did you walk the scene uh, with the crime scene investigator in this case? Yes, I did. And when you walk the scene, just tell us some of your observations. Um, so when you first enter, um, immediately on the right, there's um, like a kitchen. And then if you continue down like a very small, short hallway, um, it opens up to the living room slash dining room area. Um, and so when I entered, um, I could see um, the victim, George Torres, laying on the ground next to a blue suitcase. Did you work with the crime scene investigator to identify potential pieces of evidence for collection? Yes, I did. Uh, did you also have an opportunity to speak uh, with the defendant in this case at that time? Yes, I did. Your Honor, may I approach the witness what's been marked for identification as states T and states U and been shown to defense? You may. Ma'am, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification first as states T. Can you tell me, do you recognize what that item is? Yes, I do. Tell us, what is that item? This is the first part of the interview that I conducted with Sarah Boone on the scene. And did you have an opportunity to review that uh, disc prior to coming to court today? Yes, I did. And does that disc fairly and accurately represent uh, the conversation that took place between you and the defendant on February 24th, 2020? Yes, the first part. And is that your initials on the disc as well? Yes, sir. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to move what's previously been marked for identification as states T into evidence. Any no objection? objection? All right, what was pre-marked as states T will be received without objection as states exhibit 18. Other, other than, uh, I may have made a previous objection, other than pre-trial issue. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Ma'am, next I'm showing you what's been marked for identification as states for you. Do you recognize what that is? Yes, I do. And tell us, what is that? This is the second part of the interview with uh, Sarah Boone on the scene. On uh, February 24th, 2020? Correct. And you had an opportunity to review that disc prior to coming to court today? Yes, I did. And does that disc fairly and accurately uh, represent the second part uh, of that interview that you conducted with Sarah Moon. Yes, sir. And is that your initials on the disc as well? Yes, sir. All right, this time I'd like to move what's previously been marked for identification as states you into evidence. Any so objections? No objection. Right. What was pre marked as states you will be received without objection as states 19. And your honor, request permission to publish? You may do so.
February 24th, 2020. This time now is approximately 16.57 hours. This is in reference to Orange County case number 20-017904. I'm currently located in my unmarked vehicle um, out in front of 4748 Grants Lane, apartment number three in Winter Park um, at the Tealwood Park Apartments. And also in the car with me, my partner. Sorry, stop and um, in the front seat is, can you state your name, ma'am? Sarah Ben. Okay, and your birthday? 10 10 7 7. Okay. <laughs> so, Sarah, I know you have talked to some deputies. I know we had a very brief conversation um, just to reiterate what you told that deputy. Um, but like I was explaining, I would like to get a more further um, understanding of what happened last night and asking more detailed questions. Um, I am going to read you um, your rights, but it's just because that's how we do things. Okay. Um, so you do have the right to remain silent. Okay. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. Anything you say may be used against you in court. You have the right to talk to a lawyer before and during questioning without charge. If you cannot afford a lawyer, a lot one, one can be provided for you before questioning without charge. Has anyone there any other promise to you anything to get you to talk to me? No. Do you understand what I just read you? Yes. Okay. So, last night you said that you and your boyfriend George were here at your residence and didn't really leave that day. You said that he went to the store to buy cigarettes. Yes. What time was that around? If you recall, was it light out still, dark out? Yes, it was light out still. It's still light out. Okay. Um, but he's the only person that left, and he came back. Yes. I'm assuming. Okay. Um, it's right down the street. It's down the street. Okay. And um, tell me what what you guys were doing next. Like what what was happening? We had a bottle of wine. <laughs> we painted. We drew. We did puzzles. Do you remember what wine you guys were drinking? Um, what is what <coughs> Chardonnay? Okay. The bottles are in the trash. Okay. Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you remember around like what time this was that you guys were sh sharing the bottle of wine, painting, mm -hmm. doing puzzles? I'm gonna say mm -hmm. four ish. Okay. And was this before he went to the store or after? I'm sorry. Had he already gotten home from the store at this point to buy the cigarettes? Yes. Okay. So it was around 4 p.m. ish that you realized, and you guys were doing puzzles and art. Okay. Listening to music, enjoying each other's company. And all downstairs, upstairs, where did you downstairs. Guys downstairs. Okay. Um, we should sit on the back porch because we smoke. We have a lot of smoke inside. So. Okay. Um, and who was here last night? Was it just the two of you? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. No one ever came over at any point? No. No? Okay. We call those daughters on FaceTime. <laughs> okay. But we're just literally just enjoying one another's company. Okay. And you guys share the phone that you have, yes. correct? Um, okay. And the phone's located in there, I think, in the yes. area. Yeah. Okay. Um, so tell me what happens next. You're painting, you're going to doing this puzzle together. You obviously finished the bottle, a bottle of wine. Yes. Um, did you have one or two bottles of wine? Well, we had one previously that was maybe not even half full. Okay. But then. <clears throat> so you finished that one and then you had the full one. Yes. Okay. And sorry, what was the question? Uh, did, what did you guys do next after the bottle of wine? Like after well, we hashed the wine. We had the bottle of wine while we were <laughs> having we our arts and crafts. Mm -hmm. And from there, just waiting, we were puzzled out, we were painted out. Mm -hmm. So, being silly, let's play hide and seek, which we had played before. Like, I don't know if you've opened the door on the top of the stairwell, like, he and I have hidden in there before. Like, just having fun and enjoying each other's company. Okay. So, I mean, that's literally all it was. And then the suitcase is downstairs because I was telling you we were going to donations. Mm -hmm. And because it's not a very good suitcase, the... 
What was the question? I'm sorry. You were just explaining to me that I, oh, he decided to hide in there. So being silly, he and I were sitting there laughing at it, like with him in there. And then, so I didn't zip it up all the way, but I mean, enough to where his little fingers were out there and whatever, but still having a good time and whatever. Then I guess I decided to go upstairs and I don't know, I fell asleep. So I woke up this morning and again, thought he was downstairs on the laptop looking for a job as he usually is. And then thought, where is he? Is he on the back porch? Is he in the bathroom? Like, where is he? And then I came to about the suitcase. So I opened the suitcase. I took him out, stretched him out, started to do CPR. Where air was coming out, but and then like whatever gurgle. So I'm trying to do CPR on him. I'm shaking him, trying to get him to come to, but I can tell by looking at him something was wrong. He's been losing his teeth lately and has been complaining about his chest hurts, which is why I keep trying to get him to go to the doctor, but because he nor I have a job or insurance has been putting it off. Mm -hmm. So again, so I didn't know what to do. So I called Brian, my ex-husband. I called him, he came over, just walked in and then walked out. I grabbed my phone and I called you guys. From there, here we are. Okay. The first time you woke up this morning, did you look at your phone to see what time it was? Well, most of the time, like I'll wake up, but because he or I have a job, I'll usually just lay in the bed for a little bit longer because the house is clean. There's nothing else that we can do. Mm -hmm. Me thinking he's on a laptop looking for jobs. I can't use a laptop. So most of the time I'll just stay in the bed and collect my thoughts and get ready for the day. So do you have any idea what time you woke up that first time? What time it may have been? I don't know if you guys have I'm going to say 11 something. 11 something. Okay. Maybe. Is that when you finally got up or is that the first time you woke up? No, that's the time that I decided to get up because I figured he was downstairs on a laptop. So I right. look for jobs on the laptop and then it usually I'll clean, he'll look for jobs, or vice versa, where I'll look for jobs and he'll clean. Okay. So you think you got out of bed after 11 at some point? Yes. Okay. But we can't recall which time. Do you think you were up for like hours before that or no. collecting your thoughts? Brian, <coughs> because I was supposed to have my son today, he okay. came up from school. Brian usually calls to make sure, hey, are you sure you're getting with this today? Mm -hmm. Because I've had job interviews. Right. Are you going to pick up Lucas? So I recalled like maybe three, four times, maybe five. Um, I finally answered and that's like, do you think you were sleeping and missed those calls? No, I ignored them. You ignored them. Because okay. he's notorious for going at my phone. Okay. But I understand why because he's making sure that Lucas gets home. Right. Yeah. Okay. And to do whatever he needs to do day wise so he can schedule around it. Were you upstairs in your room at that time when you were ignoring those phone calls? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're not really sure what time you woke up initially, but you were upstairs collecting your thoughts. You figured he was on the laptop downstairs, so you were just getting ready for your day. Yes. You finally got out of bed at sometime after 11 a.m. Mm -hmm. and had gone downstairs. Yes. Okay. Looking for him. I was couldn't find him. Looked outside, couldn't find him anywhere. I was in the bathroom, I'm afraid right. maybe he's in the bathroom. But then I came to and, and then you and then you and then you called Brian. Yes. Um he came over. over. Yes, he came over. It's down the road, right? Not very far. 
Um, he came over, walked in, basically walked out. You called 911. Yes, I had my phone in my hand. I just wanted to wait for him to get there because I didn't know what to do. Great. Okay. Um, and then we arrived. Like, I couldn't, I still, to the, I don't, I don't know what happened. Like, I don't know what happened, but like, the whole thing is, the whole, like, teeth losing thing, and I don't know what happened. Like, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. He and I were having an amazing time yesterday, like we normally do. No arguments? No. Nothing? Okay. And the thing with him, though, is, which is why we've been doing puzzles and artwork lately, is that he's been stressing out about a job, of course, okay. which we've talked about. So what I did was start having him do puzzles and artwork to keep his mind off of it. Okay. His ex-wife is all over him about sending money, which he can't do because he doesn't have a job. Right. So he was stressing about that. He's been stressing about the job. But that's why I started to buy puzzles and paint to get his mind off of them, which is what we, I don't know if you noticed on the wall on there, it's all of our artwork and stuff. Okay. So I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, music, art, and playing with the dogs, dancing around the room with the dogs. I, and then decided to play hide and seek. Because we're always trying to outdo each other on where we can find, we can hide the best. How often do you guys play hide and seek? Gosh, that was maybe what, the third time? Maybe. Okay. Is it a more recent game you've gotten into, or three times in total in your relationship you're talking about? Um, lately. Lately. Because, again, like, we were puzzled out. We, we painted already, so why not? So you were downstairs hanging out. Um, do you remember around what time you guys started playing hide and seek? <coughs> Honestly, I don't. I remember it was dark out. It was dark. Okay. It was dark. But my thing is, is like when I spend time with him and I kind of, I try to get him to start doing it, it I don't look at the clock. Okay. I just, I'm here with him and mm -hmm. we're having a good time. I don't need to know what time it is. Right. I didn't know if you were like on your phone, if you got a text message, if you got a phone call last night. We called his daughters <laughs> yesterday, FaceTime. Right, what time was that at? I don't know without looking at my phone. Okay. But I ended up was that the, would that be the only activity that you had yesterday in your phone? I called Lucas. I talked to Lucas, he's my son. Okay. Well, I was calling. Mm -hmm. Morning? No, it was evening. Evening? Okay. But I'm just trying to help you like um, remember as like something you did right before hide and seek that would help you remember a time or give us a good time frame. So that's important for you know us to know. You want to be able to tell the doctors that. I don't know to be honest with you. Okay. <laughs> so when you called your when you called Lucas, was it before or after hide and seek? Before. Okay. And when you called the base time, um, his daughters before or after hide and seek? Before. Okay. And did you call the daughters first and then Lucas, or Lucas first and then the daughters? I. I know I talked to Lucas, but then we talked to the daughters afterwards. Okay. okay. And I don't remember if she called us. No, I know he called Cookie. But yes, he, we called her. What are the two daughters' names? Or just one? Just say one he daughter. has three children. It's Anna, Cookie, what her real name is Destiny. And then he has a handicapped son, George. Georgie. Okay. Who did you call though yesterday? Who did you call? Cookie. And what is Cookie's real name? Destiny. Does she have his last name or something else? It's Torres. Yes, she remarried, but I don't know her last name. Okay. Um, okay, so you know it's dark out, but you're not really sure what time it is. You play hide and seek. How long do you guys play hide and seek before he decides to get into the suitcase? Wasn't approximate. Wasn't really. I hid upstairs in the shower. Mm -hmm. 
And then came downstairs because I was tired of hanging out in the shower. Okay. So that's when he was playing around in the suitcase. So because I we both thought it was funny that oh yeah, well I'm gonna zip you up. Uh Uh-huh. You didn't come look for me. So again, it's a broken suitcase, but what do you mean by broken? It's only got one of these. But because I didn't zip it up all the way, he was doing the You mean it doesn't have like the pull part? Correct. Okay. But it No, it's got I think it's got a what do you call it? A paper clip. Okay. So the zipper to it is missing, like the actual zipper that attaches to it to help you open and close is missing. But do you think a paper clip was on it instead? There is a paper, I believe there's a paper clip on it because I know that the last That's time. That's what you used to like open this to you? Well, or you can just stick your fingers in there and. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, zip it yourself, which is why I did not zip it up all the way. Okay. So how much did you zip it up? I mean, I don't really know. You said his finger, he was in, his fingers were able to stick out? Yeah, two fingers. fingers. Okay. Yeah, so I'm figuring he, he'll, he'll get it, he'll get it. But then I wanted to go upstairs and waited for him, and eventually I guess I fell asleep. I had the dogs in the bed with me, was warm, and then fell asleep. So you guys are joking, he's in there. Um, you said you could see two of his fingers? Yes. And then, <clears throat> like, you just decided, okay, I'm gonna go upstairs now, or? Because I figured he would get out and then go upstairs and have intimate relations like we normally do. Mm-hmm. But I fell asleep. Okay. And he never came upstairs. So again, I'm thinking he's downstairs on the laptop earlier today. And then remember. Okay. So is this something that you, do you guys play hide and seek before you have sexual intercourse or do you guys just play hide and seek because you're bored and you're just trying to pass time? It's fun. We were, yeah, we were, again, puzzled out. Can't paint anymore. <laughs> Even start to curve some of the art that's on the wall now. So. <laughs> Permission to publish 19. You may. Today's date is February 24th, 2020. The time now is partially 17, 16 hours. This is in reference to Orange County case number 20-017904. My original, my first reporting um, on a separate digital recorder, um, the memory became full and we could no longer record. Um, but I am in my unmarked agency vehicle with, can you state your name now? Sarah Bourne. And my partner, Detective Scott Lowen. We are outside of, in my unmarked agency vehicle, outside of 4748 France Lane, number three, in Winter Park. Collecting a statement from Sarah. Okay, Sarah, just for recording purposes, because it did technically stop and I wasn't able to t- say the time that it stopped prior, we have not talked anything further, not on recording. Correct. Okay. And um, you do understand that you don't have to speak with me if you don't want to, correct? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. <clears throat> so I think I asked you, my last question was, and I'm not sure if you, you may have answered or not, but my last question was, um, you guys were just playing to have fun and it wasn't like a, something you do right before like sex thing. No. Or it's just because just you were, a silly. Okay. But you do say that you are intimate. Are you guys intimate every single night? No, not every single night. Okay. Um, but I mean, did you... Did you think it was going to happen last night? Yes. Did you guys talk about it? Or you just no. assumed, like, oh, we're probably going to have sex tonight? Yes. Okay. Which is normally after we do the pedals and artwork and everything, <clears throat> yes. Okay. We were just having a good time. Okay. 
just enjoying each other's company. And so, um, yeah, with the dogs. Mm -hmm. At any point, um, when he was in the suitcase, did you hear him say, um, you know, please let me out? No. Was he? Um, we were laughing about it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, did you make any jokes about it? Oh, you're in the suitcase, and I know you had said that you were left upstairs and he didn't basically come find you. Did you make any jokes about, oh, okay, well, no. now you're in the suitcase? No. Oh, okay. Um, but I'm assuming the game was over, like you guys weren't going to play, you weren't going to continue to play hide and seek anymore. Like you went upstairs and went into the room. Right. Waiting okay. for him. Okay. And you said you laid down? Yes. The dog spread in the bed. <clears throat> Do you guys sleep together in the room every single night? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. And which side of the bed do you sleep on? The like if if it's okay. Here's the bed. I'm on the left side. He's on the right hand side. Because I've got Lucas's pictures over here. He's got his kids' pictures over here. Okay. So you're so closer to the door or closer to the other? Are you closer to the door to exit your room or is he closer? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so where the pictures of Lucas are on that side, that's your side. Correct. Okay. Um, and is that where you slept last night? Did you sleep in the middle of the bed? Did you sleep on your side of the bed? I slept on my side. Your side? Okay. And um, I noticed there's like one pillow on the bed, and then there were like three up against the closet. Mm -hmm. um, are those his pillows, and he brings them into bed, or what's... No, I... When I woke up... <clears throat> What I normally do is, I don't know if you notice the mice that we have in there, but this is mice. Mm -hmm. But I'll make the bed, excuse me, clean the mouse cage, and then go downstairs. Okay. So, but what I'm saying is that normally I'll fix up upstairs and then I'll head downstairs. Okay. So that's that's why those were over here was because I was trying to fix up the bed a little bit. Okay. Okay. Were they in the bed prior? Like when you went to sleep, how many pillows were in your bed? We only have the two. You two. Okay. Well, it's the two white ones, <laughs> pink size ones. When we watch movies, mm -hmm. we'll put behind the white one, and then the third pillow just goes in between everybody else. Okay. Do you use one pillow to sleep, or do you use you each have one? Right? Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um. Okay. So you just basically didn't finish making the bed. Is my understanding. That's why the pillows are up against the. There's like three pillows up against the. Closet. Yes. They're like standing. Yes. yes. Okay. Because I'll move all the pillows off and then I'll shake out the bed and then put everything back together. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And um, <coughs> did he say anything to you while he was in the suitcase? I know. I know you guys were laughing, joking, but. Or was any jokes made? Was anything said? No. Nothing okay. okay, negative or anything like I'm telling you. Just like, anything that he said. Like, we were laughing about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I waited for him upstairs. Okay. And, did you tell him you were going upstairs? Or? No, I did not. I just, I literally went upstairs to wait for him. Was the line, was that was it all gone at this point while you guys were playing hide and seek? I think so. Okay. <clears throat> Is it um at that at that point, I mean, I don't know how often you drink, but would you both would you say that you were under the influence and he was under the influence or well I mean we weren't drunk. Weren't drunk. Okay. We weren't drunk. I mean we had a handful of glasses throughout the evening. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we weren't, like, inebriated where you couldn't drive. You could still, I mean, we were commas mentis. That's what I'll say. We were, both of us were commas mentis. Okay. I don't know what that Yeah, I don't know what that word means. I mean, we had our wits about ourselves. Okay. That's well, why he and I were playing. That's the thing, though. <laughs> this isn't a trick question. You're at your home. You're consenting adults. If you're drinking, say you were drunk. There's no law against it. Right. Nobody's judging you. You're at home. Neither one of us were drunk. Okay. We were just, I'm just trying at to the gay stage. Okay. That's what it was. 
listening to music again, dancing with the dogs. Okay. Well, luckily his blood alcohol level will show us of the autopsy as well, too. So, you know, we have that as well. Um, okay, so... Um, there was no ill will between the two of us last night. Yeah, but... When's the last time you guys have gotten into an argument? Maybe last week. Okay. Over just normal relationship stuff, or it's a little bit of everything because he had the stressing about jobs. Right. Um, he's it's been extremely depressing for him where he worked up here at the it used to be an Ace Hardware, but Ace dropped them as a franchise because of how bad the store is going now, and mm -hmm. he thoroughly enjoyed his job and everybody he worked with. But it's between stuff like that, and then of course we've got the bills that we have to pay, and I've been having to ask Brian, my former husband, for money to pay for electricity and hot water for Lucas and groceries. Okay. So I think that, of course, because he can't support me as been bothering him, which again, which is why I bought a new puzzle for the two of us to do. Right. And that's what we were working on in the painting. Okay. Do you guys um, normally argue often, not often, weekly, every other? It all depends on like if he had a good day or a bad day kind of thing, where he would just be happy to come home and see me because he knows that it's going to get better. And then most of the time he would go for a drink and we would sit on the back porch. He would tell me about his day mm -hmm. and we would have a glass of stick or a glass of wine and then kind of start our evening ish kind of thing and smoke. But then we would go inside because we're tired of being outside. And then that's when we started to do the art and puzzles and then listening to music and playing with the dogs. And it's a thing, tag it, you're right kind of thing. Gotcha. Is there anything he drinks specifically, like his go to drink, or? It's honestly whatever it is we can afford, okay. which is why we used to drink like liquor, but right. like months ago. Right. Which is why we have the wine. Wine. Okay. Um, what did you guys make for dinner last night? He made a pork sandwich with cheese. And what was it that I ate? I think it was a sandwich. Okay. And some chips. You guys have to go out and get anything? That is so good? Yes. Like a sandwich, or like a deli sandwich, like deli meat sandwich, or do you think you have pork? Him? Like he him? Had, I made a pork one the other day for me, <laughs> him, and Lucas, mm -hmm. and they were leftovers. So he he had that. He made a pork loin sandwich with cheese, and I had my there's ham and the ham sandwich with chips. Does he normally come up with that, or would he do the typical guy thing where he's downstairs and will fall asleep on the couch? I mean, he's done that before just because of his crappy day that he had, but yes, we sleep in the same bed. You normally sleep yes. in the same bed. Do you guys go to bed at the same time? Right. Most of the time, yes. But because he's been very excited about looking for a job, he might stay downstairs for half an hour, 45 minutes. And then we'd come upstairs and he and I would watch movies together until it was just okay, they're not, there's no more movies that we want to watch. And then we would just turn the lights off and go sleep. Last night, when um, you said you went upstairs, do you have like a ritual that you do prior to going to bed? Like you brush your feet, wash your, wash your face, put on TV. Is there any like normal things that you do? Me and myself? Mm -hmm. Um, no, I mean, I'll go upstairs, maybe like rinse my mouth out with Listerine. Okay. Do you and recall what you did last night? I just got in the bed with the dogs. 
<laughs> okay. Waiting for him. And how long do you think you were up waiting for him until you passed out? Like, I don't, I wouldn't say I necessarily passed out. Oh, okay. I, yes. He knows too that I'll go upstairs sometime because of how tired I am. Mm -hmm. Which is why he'll just give me my space a little bit. Maybe I'll watch a show and then he'll come upstairs. So, I mean, Well, I gotta be ordinary. No, I know, but last night, how long do you think it was prior to you falling asleep? Oh. Like, how long did you wait up for him? Um, maybe 20 minutes? 30 minutes? I mean, I, I, I literally, I dozed off, warm in the bed with the dogs, waiting for him. I didn't even bother turning the TV on. Just got in the bed. He knows too that I would go upstairs because of how tired I am. He knows. Like I'm mentally exhausted. So. Who's the, who usually gets up first? I mean, are you an early riser? Or is he an early riser? He is. Or are you, are you usually an early riser? Yeah, he has to be at work by 8 o'clock. So. He'll usually wake up at like 6 30 ish if I don't have Lucas. How long has he been out of work? Um, gosh, maybe. Well, he did some odd job stuff up there. But I think his last day was like Friday two weeks ago. So he hasn't worked in about two weeks? Yes. And during that two week period, does he maintain? Does his body naturally wakes up early or does he? Yes, it's his body clock. Okay. What time is that normally? Like 630, 645-ish. But again, if I have Lucas here, we I have to take him to school. So we're up at like 630. I'm feeling really like weird, guys. Like lightheaded. Like, I feel really weird right now. Do you feel like you're sick? No, I'm not sick, just, I, I don't know. Do you need food? I haven't, I haven't even fed my dogs today. The mice need to be taken care of still. I don't think they have any food. But again, I'm thinking he's doctors on the laptop, so he can use the laptop and then I'll use the laptop afterwards. So it wasn't when you woke up this morning, it wasn't out of the ordinary that he wasn't there. You didn't, wake, you didn't wake up this morning and go, oh, where's George? You woke up thinking, okay, George got up like he normally does mm -hmm. before me. And it's downstairs on the laptop looking for jobs. You had made a comment earlier that he's losing his teeth. Yes. I think that's, I, we don't know. I think that's one of the things subconsciously that has been really on his mind also is that he keeps losing his teeth. Like, he just would break off. He lost the whole molar or something in the back the other day while we're eating. And then he keeps talking about how his chest, and I, I'm blaming it on stress. So I don't know what that is. I don't know what the teeth thing is. I know it can't be a good sign. You said he got into, you, you said an argument, but he had a bunch of facial injuries where he had reconstructive surgery. Yes. So he and his brother got into yes. this one. Oh my gosh, it was horrific, yes. Was it any, I mean, usually when you have that much damage, it's more than just a fist fight. His brother hit him with something? No. Wait till you guys see Mo. Mo is a gorilla. Like he's. It is possibly that's what causing the teeth to get messed up. Do they have to do work on his teeth or jaw. his jaw? Or Just his eyes. His eyes. Just the horrible sockets. Yes. <laughs> oh, well, they fixed his nose too. Now the damage to his eyes uh, is that still? I mean, is it noticeable or no? Okay, so when they fixed the sockets, they, they came back and you couldn't tell that they had been damaged? I couldn't tell. 
but his children recognize it where he, they say he doesn't look like the same dad. Okay. But to me, it, it, I've never noticed it. No other damage to the jaw, the forehead, anything like that? No. It was just his eyes and his nose. Bless you. You said he's been complaining of chest patients? He had mentioned it a couple times. Well, I'm just blaming it on stress, but again, I kept trying to encourage him with or without money, go to a walking clinic. Yeah. You'll eventually get a bill. But the teeth thing has been worrying me also, and I didn't want to say anything to him about it. But we were in the process of eating dinner, and the tooth comes out. Yeah. That's scary to me. And then a red flag, if you ask me. Well, this is the reason I was asking what, what you guys had for dinner last night. What is his uh, his dietary uh, habits been lately? I mean, he, he looks super thin to me. Now, yes. I don't know, George, but he does not look like he's an average He weight. eats, believe it or not, like a horse. Like, he'll oh. eat, like, four or five times a day. Again, one of the things that has been concerning me, which... You all will be the first people that I actually say this to is his weight for the amount of food that he eats throughout the day, yeah. how he doesn't gain any weight. He and I and Lucas going out to Publix every time we step on the scale and he continuously loses weight. How well, I don't even want to step on the scale anymore. How long has this been going on for? <sighs> Months. Months. Oh, way before losing this job. Yes. It's been ongoing. I mean, I'm not even say months. I can say at least a good year. Okay. And he eats like a horse. And you said you don't know of any drug history? I, since I've been him, with him and known him, he's never done drugs. But I know him growing up in Philadelphia, he had a bad stint with marijuana and alcohol. If and when you talk to his children and or his ex-wife, she will tell you. His family will tell you. But since he's been with me, no, I have not. He's never done drugs Okay. Any other Your phone, is it password protected or yes. touch screen? It's Just, password protected. Does um George know the password as well? He doesn't know the code, but he does the face thing. Face. His face will be a mess. Okay. <clears throat> and the only reason why I have that is because I have lost two phones previously where I can't. I Before I had the passcode was somebody else being able to get into my phone because I lost it twice. So that's the only reason why I have it. Oh, like that's the reason you put a password on it yes. just in case you lost your phone? Yes. Um, okay, so do you <clears throat> recall what time you went to bed? I know that it was after midnight. Okay. What, how do you know that? Like, what makes you remember that? Because I walked up the stairwell and we have a clock that's on top. Like you see it as you're walking up the stairwell? Yes. <laughs> you have to turn the corner and it's right here. Okay. And you don't remember when you went into the shower around what time it was looking at that same clock? Um, I didn't shower. I mean, I showered earlier in the day. No, when you, you said you hit in the shower when you were oh, and see. Yes. Did you happen to look at that clock then and see what time it was? No, I just happened to look up on my way. Going to bed? Or going into the room? Yes. Um, okay, so it's after midnight. Do you think it was before 1 a.m. then? Was it between midnight and 1? Or To be honest with you, I don't know. I mean, if I had to say, it was like 12.30-ish. Okay.
Okay, and when you went upstairs, um, you and you and sorry, George were no longer having a conversation, laughing about the suitcase. You just decided to go upstairs. No, we were laughing about it. <coughs> okay, so you continued to joke about it as you were going upstairs, yeah. thinking he'll just get himself out, and then yes, that's why I didn't close it all the way. That's why I didn't close it all the way. I'm like, he'll be up here any minute now. But then I guess I dozed off. And again, I'm thinking he's downstairs on a laptop this morning. Because he gets out of the floor. Most of the time. When you put him in the, or when he got, he got into the suitcase, yes. correct? So the suitcase now, um, if we're looking at it, what side was his head on when he got into the suitcase and you said him? Was his head like on the, if we're looking if at it's it? it's right? like this, uh -huh. his head was here. The hole was here. So his head was closer to where, yes, like when you close it, his head was closer to where it's closed. No, that's where his head's here. This is him doing the finger thing over here. Right, so his head is closer to where you can close it. So when you close it, his head is on that side or his head is on the opposite side of where you close it. Because there's yeah. obviously an open, there's one in the suitcase is open. And then when it's shut, and it's obviously the yes. zipper's on opposite side. So if you do this, yes, mm -hmm. his head was here where this the zip part was. Okay. Okay. But again, that's <laughs> why I didn't send it up all the way. Is there anything else that you think is important for us to know that we haven't asked you? I don't know what happened. Like I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I don't know again if he had like a heart attack or an aneurysm or what. Like I don't know what happened. Do you keep your phone on you? Like is it always in your possession? No. Because it's a community phone between me and him. Like if he needs it, most of the time it's on the kitchen counter. Okay. Where it's like he knows that's where my phone is or hey, after we got talking to Lucas, do you mind if I call my daughters? So it's right. It's our phone. No, I get it. I just um but no, I don't walk around with my phone on me all the time. Okay. Did you bring it upstairs with you when you went when you were on a bed? No. No. Okay. So it stays downstairs. No. Or it's downstairs with him. Yes, it was downstairs with him. <coughs> because I, that's how I heard my phone ringing and I knew it was Brian because he called over and over and over and over again. Which is what he does. So you assumed it was him, but you didn't know Brian was calling you, but you assumed it was Brian. Yes, because he calls back to back, back to back to back to back to back. Okay. So I actually <coughs> I don't answer. Okay. Okay, so your phone was downstairs. Yes. Um, can you raise your right hand for me? Do you promise and swear everything we've talked about has been true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? Yes. yes. Okay. But may I ask you though, mm -hmm. because I was telling you guys about it earlier, mm -hmm. like I don't know if I, I'm, I'm afraid for my life at this point. I but I'm afraid. I don't, I don't know anything about your guys' history. Like, I don't know, other than the family not liking you, like. And they get upset because of the drinking. And just the things that we have gone through. And I, I know that they don't want him to be with me, but he and I. Are they going to, are they going to tell me that he's an alcoholic? 
Probably. Okay. Are they going to tell me that you're an alcoholic? They'll say that, but they don't know. They assume. Okay. Why do they say that he's an alcoholic? Because of his track record in Philadelphia and all of the things that he has done. Cars that he's wrecked. Ex-wives' cars. He's been divorced twice. But, and he has... Yes, they'll say that. Okay. They'll say that, but they don't know. They just don't know. <clears throat> Okay. Well, it, I mean, if... I mean, people have their opinions, okay? You can't not... It's There's nothing you can do about someone having an opinion and saying something like that. Um, as far as what's going on here, um, I told you, you know, prior, we don't know what happened. So I understand you feel like they're going to not accept, you know, what happened and they're going to think that it's your fault. But at this time, we cannot conclude and say anything differently. Um, I know we've talked about <clears throat> you possibly going somewhere else for tonight. Um, you know, you have to do what you have to do to keep yourself safe. But okay. at this point in time, no one has made a threat to you. No one has done anything. I just haven't said anything. Right, but we will obviously talk to them, and of course, we're going to instruct them that this is an ongoing investigation. You know, I have my son. <laughs> well, your son's with Brian, and you're going to stay with Brian. So, we're going to cross that bridge when we get to it. I know you're fearful of it now, but nothing has happened to where you're, you're in fear based off of past history and what they think of you and how they you know, threaten me all the time. <clears throat> Do you have proof or is it all verbal? Like would it be in your phone? No, it's verbal. Okay. It's verbal. So it's he said versus she said or she said versus she said. So yeah, hey, but they've been really nasty to me. <coughs> really okay. nasty. It's gonna be shock. It's it's gonna be they're gonna everyone handles things differently. We're not going to leave there with them hooting and hollering. She's going to collapse up, and then they're going to all come over here. Okay. Who's going to collapse? I don't even know his mom. His mom? What's his mom's name? Um, Blanca. Is that her government name, or is that just what you call her? No, I think that's her government name. <laughs> and you said she lives around here? They live down the street. When's the last time you you said he doesn't even really talk to his family because he chose you over them? So when's the last time you've seen them or talked to him? I believe he did something with his brothers a couple of weeks ago, but I don't go over there. Okay. Like, so if he goes over there, you do not go. No. But he did something with his brothers. I, I I'm guessing so. I know that they come up to his job all the time. When he was working there. Yes. Okay. So they don't come, I mean, they have come over here and has just been completely disrespectful. Okay. And again, he ended up having to tell them, don't come over here if you're going to act like that and treat Sarah like that. Do you know their address? I have it inside. I know it's Ball Hall Boulevard, but if you go down, what is this out here? Go around, mm -hmm. there's a twisty tree ice cream place on the right hand side and you turn down that road and then you make a left and then you'll see Baja and you make a right and their house is white and it's dense them and it's got a whole bunch of garden flowers. Okay. I'm gonna end my recording, is that okay? Yes. Okay. One one quick question, just out of curiosity. I'm noticing your front door it has a bunch of dents in it. What is that from? It, when we moved in, they were already there. I don't see any other doors with dents like that. Uh, whoever it was that lived here previously, I know it was a uh, girl, but that was here when we moved in. This ends our recording 1747. <laughs> Thank you.
while you were on the scene on February 24th, did you also make contact with Ryan Boone? Yes, before I spoke to Sarah Boone, yes. And did you have an opportunity to interview him? Yes, I did. Um, while on scene, uh, did you also begin uh, the process of examining uh, and cell phone? I did not examine it myself, but I, um, we have a waivers and affidavits form that has a consent portion on it. Um, and so I did start doing the paperwork for um, that. You obtained consent from the defendant in this case? Yes, on scene to search through her cell phone. And uh, what time did you become aware of the videos on her cell phone? So um, a digital um, forensic investigator responded out to the scene um, and she responded out um, a little after 7 p.m. Um, and I would assume she probably started doing, you know, whatever she needed to do. And then a short time later, she came over and got my attention and expressed to me that I needed to look at something in her phone. And these were the suitcase videos. Correct. Yeah, they were two separate videos from the night prior. When you observed these videos, um, what actions did you take? When I observed the videos, um, I directed uh, the digital um, investigator to stop um, processing and downloading her phone any further, um, and that I was going to write a search warrant for her cell phone. Did you obtain that search warrant for her cell phone? Yes, it was signed by a judge the next day. And, uh, and she was obviously able to uh, finish the, the digital uh, analysis, correct? Yeah, she was able to get like the full download as well. Um, she had already gotten the videos um, downloaded um, the night prior, but um, she was able to do whatever she does to get the full download. In the course of your interview with the defendant, um, uh, you were relayed information that I guess uh, she had gone to pu Publix the previous day. Is that correct? In the interview? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm sorry. In the interview that we just listened to about going to Publix? In, in the course of speaking with her, did you learn that uh, she had gone to Publix? Yes. I was under the impression that... Um, <clears throat> that George had gone to Publix. Did you follow up with that Publix for surveillance video in this case? Yes, I went to the Publix to gather surveillance video. And were you able to find that video of them at Publix the previous day? Yes. Your Honor, request permission to publish stage two. You may. <laughs> I'm, I'm first going to show you the video uh, taken from Publix on February 23rd, 2020, at approximately 12 15 uh, p.m. Ma'am, using the laser pointer, could you please identify 
<laughs> the victim and the defendant on this video. You can advance the video. Do you see the bottle of wine that was purchased in this video? Yes, right here. We could uh, move on to the publication of the second surveillance video. Can you identify? Uh, Mr. Torres for us in this video. Yes, it's right here. And is that the second bottle of wine? Yes. All right. course of your investigation, did you also interview uh, individuals from the apartment complex while they were living? Yes. And did you have an opportunity to also interview their neighbors as well? Yes, I did. Did you interview Juan Torres? Yes, the following day. And did you attend the autopsy in this case? Yes, the following morning. Um, Your Honor, may I approach with the defense? Yes. Members of the jury, it is 334. My understanding based on the state is the next part of their presentation is gonna be kind of long in length. So we're gonna go ahead and take our afternoon break at this point in time. Similar instruction that I've given you over the last couple of days, please don't have any discussions among yourselves or anyone else about the persons, places, things, or charge involved. I do not conduct any independent investigation with regard to those things. We'll give you a 15 minute recess. We will see you at 350. Thank you so much for your service. You all may be seated. State, anything we need to address? No. Defense. All right, we'll be in a recess for 15 minutes. Thank you. Case number 2020 CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. State. Eight strong, I have to say. William Jacobs, State. Defense. Uh, James Owens from Miss Boone. Connie Henderson from Miss Boone. Ms. Boone is seated at counsel's table wearing the same clothing from this morning. She is in custody but not wearing any restraints. So again, we'll continue to stand when our jury enters and exits. I believe we're getting to the part of the state's presentation with the recorded interview on February 25, correct? Correct. And what do we need to address with regard to that in advance, if anything? Judge, uh, I believe it's identified as uh, state's exhibit for identification. S is in Sam. Okay. And I believe that's the two hour interrogation video that I had filed the pretrial motion to suppress, which the court had denied. But contemporaneously, I want to make that uh, objection. Okay. Understood. Any other objections? 
Okay. Uh, it was edited um, based on the court's granting of the motion in limine, defense's motion in limine prior to trial. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And a copy of the edited version was provided to the defense, I, I believe, on the first day of jury selection. That's true. Okay. And is I'm assuming the video that's going to be provided to our jury this afternoon is that exact same video? Yes. Do you want me to read the 2.2 instruction prior to it being played after it being received into evidence? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Which instruction is that? That's the instruction on edited recording. Okay. Okay. Anything else we need to address state before we bring back in our jury? Mr. Beck, Mr. Your Honor, if I may real briefly. Appearances, sir. The contemporaneous objection, though. I'm supposed to talk about the reports that the court referenced in the last sidebar before the jury was brought in this afternoon. Fine. Let me just get your appearance, Mr. Beck. I'm sorry, yes. Kevin Beck, on behalf of Sarah Booth. Yes, sir. Uh, there was a discussion regarding these uh, depositions that were going to be taken this afternoon uh, of the defense witnesses that were recently noticed. I do have some concerns about uh, the court having indicated to defense that if we had reports, things of that nature, we should share those with the state to the extent that those reports were generated by our investigator there, potentially for product privilege. And so we're happy to work with the state, cooperate with the state, give them what we can. But I want to expressly state um, that we are not waiving the work product privilege by providing whatever information we can to uh, allow this process to move forward. Understood. I'm not seeking to have you uh, turn over anything to the state that may be protected by any attorney, client, or work product privilege. My, my takeaway was there's something that could be provided. If it can, fantastic. If it can't, the court's ruling from previously still remains. Um, since we have an opportunity to revisit our list, during the lunch break, did you have an opportunity, Mr. Owens, uh, addressing the USB to CD conversion for any evidence to be provided or sought to be introduced by the defense? My understanding is that Mr. Billy Lane was going to go to Staples or somewhere and purchase one of those uh, DVDs, CDs, or whatever it is that makes the conversion. So we anticipate it. You know, okay, excellent. All right. Anything else we need to address then before we bring back in our panel state? No, defense. All right, let's stand and bring back in our panel. State to recognize our jury. Thank you, Your Honor. Defense to recognize our jury. Yes. I right, thank you. You all can be seated. <laughs> Members of the jury, again, if you could just raise your hands to comply, the, uh, confirm you complied with the court's instructions. Record reflect all hands have been raised. Thank you very much. State, you may continue. On February 25th of 2020, uh, did you set up a follow-up interview uh, with the defendants in this case? Yes, I did. And that was after you had attended the autopsy that morning, correct? The, the interview, the follow-up interview was to be conducted after the autopsy. Not necessarily set up, but it was to be conducted after the autopsy. I apologize if I misspoke on that. Okay. Uh, was that interview uh, recorded? Yes, it was. Audio and video. And where did that interview take place? Central Operations at the Orange County Sheriff's Office. Yes. Your Honor, may I approach the witness who has been marked for identification as states S and shown to the defense? You may.
fam, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification as states S. Tell me, do you recognize that disk? Yes, I do. And tell us, what is this disk? This is the follow-up interview um, conducted on February 25th, 2020 at Orange County Central Operations with the defendants there. But. And does it fairly and accurately represent the interview uh, that took place between yourself and the defendants? Yes. And is that your initials on this disk? It is, yes. And you had an opportunity to review it prior to coming to court today? Yes. You are at this time, I'd like to move what's been marked for identification of states S into evidence. The only objection is from the previous pre-trial issues. The state will receive, Court will receive an evidence that was pre-marked as states S over objection as states exhibit 20. And your honor, request permission to publish. Momentarily. Members of the jury, I have an instruction to read to you before the exhibit 20 is published to you. Members of the jury, you are about to view and listen to a video recording. The court instructs you that the recording has been edited to eliminate irrelevant portions that would not add to your understanding of the case. The fact that the recording has been edited should not concern you in any way and thus must not impact the way you view, listen to, and consider this evidence. Too, so, but your son was there when? When was he last there? 
Oh gosh. Last right. year's dating is there like last Tuesday. Last I don't know if it was Tuesday. But yeah, she was there last week, so Well we're talking about Sunday. We're made, we're just talking about what occurred Sunday. Because like I said, the injuries are they occurred within that time period. So you're talking about day before yesterday. Sunday leading into Monday. You brought this yesterday at one, so but the incident you guys were painting and stuff the night prior. Correct. So we're talking about Sunday. And then why I'm thoroughly confused because <coughs> we had a good time sitting on the back porch having wine and serving a couple of cigarettes and then decided to go inside and literally paint, do puzzles, and play mm -hmm. and listen to music. That's why nobody got out of sorts. This is what mind blowing to me. Like, I don't, mm -hmm. I have no clue. Nobody laid a hand on anybody. He also had, um, like on the left side of his forehead, he had basically bruising, um, and um, on like his head, his skull. I have no idea. As if something hit him, I consider not for touched him. him. I have not touched him. I have not touched him. How would you approach him? Tell me we'll both know. I have not touched him. Yesterday, when we took photographs of your overall body, um, and they did the buccal swab, did they go under your fingernails? No. Okay. Are you willing to let us absolutely swab underneath your fingernails? Go for it. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea, and I don't want to seem out of sorts, but I have no idea. We had a good day. Mm -hmm. It was a good day. We had good days, lady. Mm -hmm. Even considering everything that's going on with our jobs and life in general and ex-wives and everything. It's been good. Like, I don't even know where this is coming from. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know last physical was probably, you said, I think, what, a month ago? Mm -hmm. Where you got the injury, right? What, you said that was okay, a few weeks, give or take, yeah. A few weeks. That was the last, like, physical altercation between the two of you? Um... Just a month ago, he was a curtain rod. Yeah, a curtain rod. That's why I can't believe you guys didn't take that either. <laughs> huh. Like, we've been good. I don't know if, like, it's since the last time he got out of jail. Like, we've been good. He's been having his classes mm -hmm. and his seeing his probation officer, who's amazing. So. What do you mean by good? What's your definition of good? The probation officer? I oh, no, You said you guys have been good. What's your definition? I've been good. I don't think you all understand. He comes at me all the time. He comes at me. So it's either I flee or try to go upstairs and go to sleep. That's usually what it is. I don't know if you talk to Brian about any of that, but most of the time when I flee, I go over there. So, great, but you're saying that you guys have been good. And when I asked you yesterday, there has been the last incident that you can remember was the current run incident, which you said was a month ago. So, give or take. Great. So what do you mean by he comes after you? Like, he really helped him. I bailed him out of jail, what, three times. I've gone to every single hearing and every single arraignment, everything that I did for him. Gone to see all his public defenders, go to the state, I've gone to the state. I, I did everything for him because I'm trying to help it because I have a bad hope in him. And he was trying, he was really trying. Just, and then he starts to think about things and it just, I think he gets overwhelmed, and then it's like, next thing you know, he's drinking. So it's like, oh man, I know where this is going to go, so I'm going to go upstairs and read a book, or I'm going to go for a bike ride, or I'm going to do something else, where I don't want to drink. I don't want to drink. The occasional wine, whatever, or if it's a weekend, that's when you, you have a good time. You don't have to wake up the next day. I have to wake up the next day and do things. I have to tend to Lucas. I have to take him to school. I have all this stuff to do. He doesn't know how to, I guess, maintain himself where I can do 50 things at once and still know the 50 things more previously, prior than I need to get done. He can't process like that. He didn't process like that. So if he would literally, not literally, but have food come out of here. So the next thing you know, he doesn't want to deal with it. I'm gonna go get something to drink. So the majority of the time, I would hang out outside or do something else because I don't want to drink. And every time, every time, his job broke his heart. 
And it means that I've been in so much pride and stuff. And the, the store that he took care of so much totally went downhill. Mm -hmm. And that broke me to heart because he had put so much work and effort into fixing it up. And his manager was awful and basically gave up on all of the employees. So I think that had a huge bearing on why he would drink so much. His ex-wife is bonkers. Mm -hmm. She was all over him all the time. Send me money, send me money, send me money. How can I send you money when I don't have a job? And he's still trying to take care of me and Lucas by paying a bill here or there, getting some groceries. So he always had something on his mind, which is why, again, I got the bubbles and the bank to try and get him off of it so he don't have a drink or he doesn't have a drink. So when you all see my phone, you can see all of the damage he has done to me and the videos of him smashing my television because he's belligerently drunk. Where most of the time, I just don't want to be there. And I try to help him. I try to calm him down. Eventually, he just passed out. Well, yesterday, I mean, it sound like you guys were just drinking like a glass or two. Like, yeah, you obviously have the bottle, but you... I mean, you that. told me on the, yeah, but you told me on recording, like, that you were not drunk, he was not drunk, you guys were having I, a good time. I don't get, I can't get drunk. Like, number one, I do not want to get drunk. I don't like being non complimented having my wits about myself. I don't like feeling out of control. Mm -hmm. So, I'm just saying, you're, you're making it sound like, like he's a raging alcoholic today, and yesterday, I was kind of asking you those questions, and you're like, a little defensive, like, no, we're not alcoholics. He, I have not, you know, but you guys are both sober on Sunday, to your knowledge, because when I said you went and passed out, you were like, no, I didn't pass out, I just fell asleep. So now it's kind of like, what is it? Is it? Were you guys drinking and it got out of hand and no. it got physical? No. Or is it? Sunday was one of the better days that we have had in quite some time. He's dancing with my dog. You can see that too on the pictures, him loving the dog. He loves the dog and dancing around, having a good time, and just, just being happy kind of thing. He doesn't know, I can't, I mean, I can get like maybe two, three glasses of wine and I'll be fine, but I have to have my wits about myself because I don't know what to expect. Well, let's talk about Sunday. What was Sunday? How were you, like, how many glasses of wine did you have? How many glasses of wine did he have? The bottle was gone. I mean, I don't know if you poured any out. Yes. No, that was from previous. <laughs> you said that there was a half bottle left yeah, over. Mm -hmm. And then um, that you had wine. The, well, I don't even know how the wine, how did you guys get the wine for Sunday? I'm guessing he went to public. He, does he well, do the, does he like leave the house and you stay home or do you go to public? Like, cause I can't talk about that. Okay. Did you go with him Sunday? No. Public? So most of the time what happens is because the convenience store where we get cigarettes is here and then public literally is catty to do it. Okay. So what he'll do is he'll start, go by public, and then on the way back, catch the convenience store. Okay. So what he did Sunday? I, I'm guessing that's what he did because next thing I know he's walking in with lots. Okay. So that's, okay. it's him trying to be nice, so I don't have to go out and do it. Plus there's stuff that I run the house and I have to take care of. So that's usually what will happen. Or I'm folding laundry and he'll go run out and do whatever. Okay. So, where were you guys on, mm -hmm. on drunkenness, not drunkenness on Sunday? <coughs> I told us you weren't drunk. No, I was not drunk. Okay. I was not drunk. So with him, I don't know, I, I know when it's like, oh, okay, man, where I told him, slow down, it's dark, you can't shut the you. slow down, slow down. Bless you. And another thing too is I don't like listening to music with him because he gets too involved in the music and the music that he listens to is a little rough around the edges and like just, it makes me fractious listening to his music. So. I kept asking him, let's not, let's just you and me talk. You and me will just be the ones that are talking, which was fine, because I mean, we were playing with a dog, whatever, and then it's like, okay, now let's do the painting. 
We just did the puzzle, took a break, now let's do this. Sure enough, that dog, we're sitting there talking, laughing, talking about new movies, we're watching movie trailers while we're doing painting and all that other stuff. So it's still background noise to him, because I think that's what he's used to, is having background noise. For me, I can sit in here all day with not a peep, but he always has to have some kind of background noise, which I didn't mind because the trailers were cool, and he was interested in showing them to me getting excited about movies that were out, or upcoming. Mm -hmm. So in your laptop, you're doing mm -hmm. okay. And I mean, and then it, we, it was, we said it was a good day, like, you guys didn't have any, have any uh, conversations about your relationship, you guys didn't go down, like, the rabbit hole, like, had too many to drink, and you guys started right. getting, nope, when I tell you it, it made me so happy that he actually listened to what I, I had to say, with just, We'll get through it. This will be fine. It's just, it's it's a small hurdle that you and I together will get through because. I'm talking about the money, jobs, stars. Yes. Nothing no. relationship wise, though. Like, no issues. Relation, like, did you guys have a conversation about your relationship or was it just about just like what's going on right now? Got it. I try to evoke it from him. So, he gets it off his chest because I call him the volcano where eventually he's going to erupt. Right. And what he's learned in his process is to communicate, mm -hmm. which is a huge thing in a relationship. Right. Where he has been practicing communication. So he actually talks to me about things mm -hmm. and unburdens himself. Put it on me. I'll sit there and try and figure it out for you. Like I have almost everything. Mm -hmm. Not a worry. Just tell me. Get it out of you. Right. But it was, when I tell you, I was so happy. Like, it was such a good day. I kid you not. The weather was beautiful outside. I'm the one that had him go inside so we can do puzzles and painting and listen to music or whatever else he wants to do. So then he starts doing whatever it is we're doing together in the living room and then starts talking because I think he gets comfortable with, okay, you know what? We're here. It is a good day. Let me go ahead and explain myself. So I know. Nobody else knows, but I know. Nobody knew George better than I did. I say that I knew George better than himself. And I tried in every way, shape, and form. As everyone. I helped him. I took care of him. I missed him a lot, and I didn't even sleep last night. I missed him a lot. <laughs> I mean, is there any chance it got to be too much for you and you couldn't handle taking care of him? And I never stopped. I, know. I never stopped. That's what I'm here for. I never stopped. I'm here now and I'm still trying to help him. Yeah, we just don't. I mean, it's unexplainable how he got these injuries. And I had no idea. You were the only one with him. 100% right hand to God. I have no idea how he got them. Nobody touched anybody. Nobody touched anybody. Um, you had mentioned that you take uh, you would take photos, videos, kind of like a proof and just in general. Yeah, I was just documenting at one point, but that was that was way before. I think the last time that he got arrested, where he was flying off the deep end. <laughs> But then I had him bailed out. I got him out of jail. Right. But because he had violated the pretrial diversion, they this time it's probation. So you don't have a choice in it. You have to go see your probation officer. You have to go to these classes. It's court order. Mm -hmm. Where it took him a while to get used to it and understand, they're not messing around. I even went down and met his uh, probation officer, which I say I she, she's wonderful. That's one of my questions we need to talk to you about. Hugged me and said how much she knows that I take care of him. She called me personal when, I, when George was at work, when he was working. 42 minute phone call. She and I just saying how grateful she is that George has me. And she knows how hard I'm working to help him, just as she is and just as the class as well. So once he started actually going on a regular basis to the probation officer and then to his substance abuse class and his, I don't know what BIP stands for, veterans intervention program. Mm -hmm. 
and actually listening to what it is everyone had to say, he changed. Like I could, I could see it change in him. Or before lashing out, he would think about it. And would always come home and show me his paper. And we would look over his papers together. Or it's like, wow, you actually are learning this in class? And some of the stuff that they would show him, like videos, he would come home and be like, Sarah, I'm so sorry for what I've done to you. Because for a video that he watches, to make him feel that way, where it's like, oh man, I have done her wrong. But he's changed. He changed. And that's why you're still with him. Even though he's done all these things to you. And when I tell you I love him, I love him. And when you have, when you love somebody, you have them. Everybody tells me that. Oh my God, you're so tell me that. Oh, this property manager. <laughs> At some point, somebody gets enough, then they have to, to do something to defend themselves. I would just flee. And I don't know if you would like to see it on my phone, or I think I think it's actually on a laptop. I actually, because, and you have to understand too, I have, like, prior to classes in PO, take them out. How many times? I had them arrested. How many times? But you also went down and down. I know. The next day. Well, I know. Was that your laptop? Um, what did I going to tell you? Oh, previously, mm-hmm. I actually looked up how to file a restraining order. Okay. Because I would take him out, his parents, because of them constantly having to take him back in, his bags of clothes, all his stuff. The one time, the last time, the father came out, and I laid, and just not even, I, think, I don't even know if he knew what was just in the car. Just open the back of my car and start throwing all the strap and just throwing it like throwing it like the car would just be throwing all my stuff. At that point, because I continually did it, not continually, I think I maybe did it three times, and he has nowhere else to go. They got fed up and said, "Nope, either you're staying there or you're staying here. But if you're staying here at their place. It's permanent. You're not going back over there anymore." So what happened is he pursues me. So. I don't know if y'all know where Katie Way Trail is. Okay, so we it's literally right right there from our apartment. Mm-hmm. Would I ride his bike to work, but before he would leave extra early and come up to the wall, stay on top of his bike and pull his head over because he didn't know that I would be outside having my morning cigarette and cup of coffee. Where and I would also know too what time he would get off of work, where I would know come get off of work you can do the same thing. So it's not like I ever got like a break from him where I told you all yesterday or whatever it was. I started to feel that it was too much togetherness. And when you have too much togetherness, friction happens. So I'm gonna go right my bike. I'm gonna go upstairs and read a book. But what he every what does he say, every waking moment he wants to be with me. So and mind you, our town home is either upstairs or downstairs. So it's like, if you would like to sit downstairs and watch a movie or play on the laptop, look at some jobs, you're more than welcome to. I'm just going to be upstairs and watching one of my shows or maybe reading a book. So, and then when that would happen, we really need that. So what's for dinner? And then we would cook together and eat dinner and then crawl in the bed and watch a movie. Can you talk about this is like recent on our kind of like plot screen? Like, when, what are you about? It's like a little while. Now you're talking about now you're talking about tension building up and that you need space. So, have you been feeling that way lately or? No. Okay. No. <laughs> my thing is too, so you all know. Oh, I, I hate you. Can't talk to her, but. Um, being his ex wife, when I say a monster, she's a monster. Like, it does, she withholds. For their children from speaking to him. So he gets upset about that and she's like completely berates him about money, about father that he is, what he did to her, all this other stuff. It doesn't matter. I mean, mind you, this is not like a recent, but which is why he doesn't even bother calling anymore because he knows that he's, she's going to answer and he's going to have to talk to her, so therefore he can't talk to his daughter. The so other time he talked to her, made, made her talk to Cookie. That's on my cell phone, too, so you can see it. Okay. 
It doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter. What does she have to do, though, with anything about what happened Sunday into Monday? Like, no, I'm just saying, like, previously, okay. why the incidents, what happened is she played a big part of it. Okay. On that yeah. job, you know, and money, and grocery, and all that. Okay. Sunday, I, <laughs> when I tell you this, I have no idea. I have no idea. Is there anybody else in the house? No, it's just me and Adam. Um, since talking yesterday, do you remember any like time timelines better? Like what time uh, you guys were playing? What time you he was zipped up in the luggage? What time you were upstairs? We started because we had we cleaned the house a little bit. This is the laundry. You started that activity around four. You said yes, around four or four thirty ish, and then. You just said that it was dark when you were playing behind and seek, and I'm just curious yeah. if you remember. But when we were outside, that's where we would start mm -hmm. and talk about things, and then eventually I was the one I had to come inside. So we. I was trying to remember what time that was, what she was asking. Mm. It's just if you went up, you went up to bed around midnight, midnight, and fell asleep around 12:30 ish. But those are the only times I have. So I have four and I have midnight. So there's a big gap. So I'm just curious, like, if you recall when you went upstairs to hide in the shower or like when we started to play. I mm -hmm. see. Yeah. Well, we went inside probably about by half a day. We were, we were out there too long. It was about six ish. Then you talk about coming in and outside and like, mm -hmm. okay. well, we have two of these chairs that are out there and right. just enjoy the weather. Gotcha. Plus, it's starting to get dark and mad to make Yeah. So, let's go inside. I don't want to be out here anymore. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go. So, we're doing whatever. We did it for a while because that puzzle, um, it makes up better. We saw it. Um, worked on the puzzle again, finished it, started to paint. Well, started listening to music for a little bit. Started to paint. Uh, can we turn the music off? No problem. Started to talk, paint, whatever. Maybe. Gosh, that was all the virtual math for probably a good hour and a half. So, 8 o'clock ish? Is my time to hide upstairs originally? No, that's when we were like painting. So then it's like, okay, well, I, we can't, I don't want to paint anymore. Let's keep, ah, uh, come on. Okay, you want to hide and see? What he does is, okay, tag your it. We'll show the like, Okay, we know. Okay, take off. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. And then you went upstairs, and then you didn't come up, and you came down. And the suitcase was there originally because you guys were planning to do donation. And so it was already there. Um, have you guys ever played the, you said you played hide and seek like probably three times in your relationship? Mm -hmm. When you have played, have you ever zipped him up in a suitcase prior? No. Okay. So it was just kind of like that prop was there, and it was there, yes. and it was in play because. Why do you say it like that? Though? I would never do that. You would never zip them up in a suitcase. Well, I mean, we were playing. No, I got that, but I'm saying I, I want to talk about hide and seek, which is a game. So the suitcase originally is in our closet, buried all the way to the back. If you, um, I know the CSI people stole our closet. Our closet needs to be cleaned out really bad. My son's clothes need to be cleaned out really bad because they don't fit him anymore, and that's how we're looking at it. So he took it upon himself, including that suitcase, to take it downstairs so we can get all of our clothes, our donations, and everything, and just leave the whole thing by the clothing and shoe thing at my son's school. No, we're just, I'm just asking, out of the, in the past, like, have, have you ever zipped him up in anything, jokingly or not, but obviously yeah. I understand, you know, you're claiming that Sunday it was a joking matter, and you were laughing, he was laughing, but what I'm just asking is in the past, like, is this something that I normally do? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. Um, we were actually this last game running out of places to hide, because... We have a town home where it's upstairs or downstairs. So, um, okay. So, do you remember making any videos or maybe having any cover, anything, any photos, videos that you remember doing on your phone on Sunday? <laughs> no. 
I think I took a picture of a dog. Okay. But your phone is password protected, you have the password, he has the facial recognition, so it's not like someone else could be on your phone. No, I have both. But you have the face and the password. Yeah, yeah, but he only has the face, correct? No. To be able to get onto your phone, you told me that he looks at the phone. Oh, I misunderstood. I thought you were asking if I did. Yes, it's me. Okay. Does he have access to your phone? Because you said it's yeah. your phone. Okay, how does he have access? He's got to have on your phone? Yeah, it's right there on the kitchen counter. Okay, but how did you get it to it? He's password protected. So he'll come and get it to me, I'll just do a face thing. Where sometimes too, like, he, <coughs> but he'll judge with me and say, okay, I need to borrow your phone. And he'll hold it while I'm cooking or doing something, do the facial recognition. Okay, so he doesn't know the password and he doesn't have the facial recognition. No, he is the only other person that would use your phone. Yes, to make other Well, Lucas. Right. So Lucas wasn't there or something. Hey, I. Great. Um, so, to your recollection, no videos on Sunday. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I mean, I, I guess I'm to, maybe you take a picture of them, the two of Tess and the dogs, and George and have them dancing, but I mean, or it's just Tess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I have something that I want to show you that we found, um, and it was from your phone. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Can you move it around to the end? No, I don't remember that. For everything you've done to me. For everything you've done to me. Your batteries are all the time. Oh, okay. Let me. Battery doesn't last very long. It used to last a lot longer than that. I don't know what happened. Okay. Let me just grab something. <laughs> no, I was just simply asking because um, you had a, a look on your face when she asked you if you've ever done that before. You looked kind of shocked. And no. Kind of, but why did you say it like that? Like, I don't think you all understand who I am. Where? Okay. Well, tell me. I mean, I've always been a straight A student. I am an outstanding mother to my son. I excel at everything. I I would not do that. You would not sit somebody in a suitcase? Well, I didn't like completely lock it. I mean, I opened it with one finger. I left enough in there for him to get out. And I wasn't planning on going upstairs and going to sleep. No, it's just the way you said it. You guys are scaring me. Sorry. Well, we just want you to watch this. It came from your phone. Don't you want to know what's on it? Yes, please. <laughs> Can you see it? Is it long? Because I don't know how much I can take. I don't know how much I can take. <laughs> Do I have to watch this? I continuously throw up. I don't sleep. I don't want to see it. That's okay. <clears throat> well, it's on your phone. And you can either explain it or we take it for what it is. Yeah. We're just trying to give you the opportunity to tell us what's going on. That's it. It's that long? Two minutes. For everything you've done to me. For everything you've done to me. How cute. How cute. That's you. I 
I don't want to watch it. Okay. Last, last time we talked to you, you said that you put him in the suitcase, you had two fingers hanging out. I flipped him over. I flipped him over, and that's where it was. There's two different videos and a still picture where, yeah, it shows you flipping him in different positions. And him saying that he can't breathe, and you're saying, fuck So this is upside down. So in order for him to have gotten into it, it was flipped up. Right. It was flipped up normal. Yeah. Like, as if you're packing something. So this is upside down. Guys, this is killing me right now. So this image is upside down, and then this small video that occurred 11 minutes later is flipped over the other way. Closer to your dining room table. Okay. Now he's obviously still in there. So he didn't. How did that? How did it go from the back to the front? I flipped it. Okay. My plan was not to go upstairs and go to sleep. Well, that's what you did. Yeah. But not intentional. No, you told me you went upstairs because what? You were upstairs for bed. Stop here. Okay, but. Show me where you can see any fingers coming out. Because there's the end. It's and his head's right here. Mm -hmm. So going like this, rather than going all the way up, it's like this. But why is he saying I can't breathe? And why is he pushing on it as if he can't get out? Uh, it show a hole. You, there's no hole. There's no fingers. I don't see his fingers. There's no hole. I don't know what you want me to tell you. Like I don't know like what you want me to tell you. I'm just showing you, I'm just telling you what we see and what we've heard from the audience. I understand. I understand. He's begging to let for you to let him out. You sound you're laughing in the beginning and then in the end it sounds kind of like a no, it's not malicious. Well, saying fuck you. It's not malicious. Then what is that? What does fuck you mean to you? Well, like if you were to if I were to tell like oh, yeah. like I didn't help everything but a white woman. So okay. I my intention was not to leave him in there. Please understand that. My intention was not to leave him in there. But you went upstairs thinking yeah. that he could get himself yes. out, but the video shows that I was gonna see his fingers and he'll be up there in a And then thirty minutes later he didn't show. And he's told and I stand like that. Do you think he's joking? Uh, you told me he was laughing, and I we were. The video, there's, there's no we first got in there. Both of us were. So how long was he in there for? Like this video is at 11, 12 when it's carried. So was he in there for like a long time prior to that? No, no, no. 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 So it goes from funny to no longer funny. <laughs> but I was the only one laughing. But I didn't think that he was like panicky. Like I didn't. I. So pushing up on a suitcase saying, Sarah, 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 I can't breathe. George has done that in the past before, too, where it's just like he thinks that he's well with me kind of thing, where it's like, I well, he's me. never been locked in the suitcase, but now he's going to get up. So it's kind of, I thought it was more like crying wolf, crying wolf kind of thing. Okay. And again, my but, yeah, but nowhere in there is he laughing, is he joking, he is begging. And you're the only one laughing. Okay. And you're the only one saying derogatory comments. Like you're mad. No. Please don't. I don't mean to sound negative, and I don't know if I can say this, but <clears throat> like it's like you guys are kind of trying to like feed me. Like no, I'm just trying to show you a video that you no longer want to watch because you probably don't want to know the outcomes of how and what you said. Well, I know what. You know, you know what's on that video now? No. You remember making that video? No. Oh. Why don't you remember making the video? Probably because we had been drinking. But you weren't drunk. No. Just because I went upstairs and... Just you because you're drunk doesn't mean that you... That you, you, you were not drunk. You said that you had your wits about you. You said he had his wits about you. Mm -hmm. You said that you don't like not having your wits. In my experience, if somebody cannot remember doing something to the extent of making two videos and a video and taking a photo, they are intoxicated. Okay. I understand where you all are coming from. Well, we're I trying to make sense of it. We're trying to figure out this video. We're listening. 
I did. Like we were playing, and then like I thought it was my plan was not to go upstairs and go to sleep. My plan was not to he'll be up here any minute. But you yeah. willingly went upstairs and went to sleep. No one forced you to go upstairs and get my plan was out. also to leave him in the suitcase. So why didn't you take him out? Because I went upstairs and then I fell asleep. But why didn't you consciously think He's asking to come out. He's I didn't do it intentionally. What did you think was going to happen to leave somebody on a confined space like that? Well, I thought by not giving it up all the way, it would be okay. My plan was not to leave him in the what was your plan? Waiting for him to come upstairs. And then when he did it, I fell asleep. You said you're up there 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, somebody not coming up. I Knowing that you that the last time you saw him was in the suitcase, thirty minutes later, you're like, mm, maybe I should go check on him. Maybe I shouldn't. No. When you that didn't cross your mind. That's like that's, that's like an assumption. Like that's what you all are thinking. Just we're asking. It's the whole. You tell us. It's the drinking. That's what it is. It's the drinking. I thought it was like I thought he was okay. Like I didn't. That you he's all. He's telling you he's not. He's telling you, sir. I he can't breathe. He's saying your name, and you're like, "That's my name. Don't wear it out." Guys, that's how we are with each other. Like he is. Nobody understands our relationship. This the whole suitcase thing never happened before. Would you leave someone else in the suitcase? Would you leave Lucas in the suitcase jokingly? Because it was a no. joking matter. You put him in there jokingly. Would you leave Lucas jokingly in there? And you love Lucas, right? And you I wouldn't do that to him either. I wouldn't do that to him. So I, I do. Well, so I'm like, again, I don't think you all understand. Like, it's. I mean, it's not my. That was not my intention. <laughs> well, I don't have any idea what I did. But by your action, that's exactly right. You get to the point where you've done so much for somebody and they don't show no. you any appreciation. He did. Not by by your words in the video. I don't get that. He did. Because you're bringing up the fact that when he's choking you, you can't breathe. That's how you felt when he cheated on you. You couldn't breathe. And you he verbally, did. several times, said to him, just fuck you. Well, you, you said it in the video. Well, let's play the rest of it. When I say cheating, it's... On his thumb. Okay. Cheating is cheating. I think so too. Exactly. It's your definition of cheating, though, so I know. That's what she's the word cheating. And that's what you told him in the video. That I couldn't breathe when you cheated on me. No. That's how I felt when he said to Sarah, I can't breathe. And you told him. I don't know what you This is. What would you say if somebody told you that they had done this? So much. You shut somebody in a suitcase and went up and went to bed. Do you all not think, so you all think that it's like, oh good, I got him in there, now I'm going to go to sleep? Is that what you guys are trying to assume? Or trying to, like, or just the video is very portraying of the opposite of what you told us. No. It is not, it is not leading up, it is not matching what statement you gave us in the car. So, and that's why we want to know. And the, I don't injury, the injuries are not consistent with what you told us. So we have a lot of inconsistencies, and this video explains itself. It really, truly does. You don't think that I have thought about it? <laughs> thought about the video or thought about but No, again, if you don't mind, please. So you all are assuming that it's like, oh, good, I got him in there, now I'm going to go to sleep. Is that what you all are saying? Well, it's not an assumption when that's what you told us that happened. That's what happened. And the video. No. Yeah, I mean, but I'm not going to say you thought he could get out on his own. Yes. But the video shows that he can knock it out on his own. But I, but when I invested, I invested with one finger. From the outside. But it had the hole in it. 
And you're claiming that had a paper flip, so that's what assisted you in doing it. No, that's what you told us. When I had my sweatshirt, I said I thought it had a paper flip on it. It had the zipper part is broken. That yeah, which is why we were going to say it. I I just you were able to zip it from the outside very easily. That's the way they're designed. But you put it on the inside too. I don't know how. Well, why wouldn't you have gotten to allow it? Because I don't know. Like, I don't know if you saw, like, where the hole was. I don't know. No, I didn't see the hole. You're the only one that. That's what I'm saying. Like, he's in one position, and where his head would be, we should be able to see fingers. And then when I flipped over onto this right side, again, his head is closer to us facing the video, so we should be able to see fingers. And we don't see anything. We see no movement of him trying to unzip it or physically unzipping it. All we see is pushing up, trying to push out of it. Please do not assume. I'm not assuming. I haven't assumed anything. I follow evidence. But my intention was not, again, oh good, I got him in there. Now I'm just going to go to sleep. What do you think someone that knows nothing about this or here's just a little bit like, oh, they were playing around in a CG and then game and then not how to play with it. Wait. That's what happened. So you let him out before. I mean you put him in, so why do you take him out? But because I was upstairs and I fell asleep. No, before you went upstairs. You like consciously had to walk upstairs. You, I mean you obviously remember going to bed because you're giving me a time frame on that. And you specifically mm -hmm. told me that. That you I went upstairs. Don't my intention is not going to happen. I am sick about it. I've never done anything like this before in the past. I am sick. Especially with that. I thought I couldn't sleep last night. I don't well, know. Well, here's the thing. You tell us the last night, you, you vividly remember this when you told us last night that he was laughing, you were laughing, you put him in the suitcase, he has two fingers sticking out, and you go to bed. Now we see something totally different. And it actually shows you upset and, again, using uh, derogatory terms to him when he's begging for his life to get out of that suitcase. So, so but my thing is, we're just, assuming, we're not assuming. But the thing is, but, so it just happened to be that whenever I was videotaping or doing whatever else it was, it just happened to not have that in it. And you also in the video you can't see any holes. There's nowhere in that where the zipper separates and you can see a hole. If there's a hole, he's pushing on it, begging you to get out. We should probably see that 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 hole. He essentially would have been able to get out. Huh. Alcohol. Based on what you're telling us, he should have yeah. been able to get out. But the video shows him attempting to get out, begging to get out, and he can't. So that's that's just what we're trying to figure out. I don't know if. Maybe you had too much to drink, you just took it all away, and then you know I did not sip it up all the way. I did not sip it up all the way. This is horrific, okay? Horrific. This is terrible. Horrific. I don't think I'll ever be right because of this. Ever be right. Dealing with everything else that I have in my life, personally, and then this. Whom I love. It was not intentional. I will put my hand on the Bible. It was not intentional. I would not do that to him or anyone else. But you did. Not intentional. You intentionally went up to bed. I you didn't went up to bed because I'm thinking, okay, hold on, hold on. Yeah. How did you not intentionally go to bed? You said you went upstairs and got in bed. That's intentionally going to bed. Waiting for him. And he doesn't come, but you don't go down to check on him. So I happen to go to sleep. When I say go to sleep, and what you don't want to go to bed. What do you normally do when you go to bed? What do you mean? What is the bed for? Going to sleep. Right. So you go to bed. But I'll be to do that. Like, I you need to help them. Okay. You kept telling us, hey, I wasn't intoxicated, I wasn't this, I wasn't that. Being drunk and intoxicated, which, then you can tell the I've been drinking, but. Okay. So if you weren't intoxicated, then why would you ever leave somebody in a suitcase that's begging to get out, that's telling you they can't if breathe? If I weren't, if I hadn't been drinking, you you still think it would be the same thing? Or it's like, hop in, I'm going to go to sleep. 
Is that what you all are trying to do? To portray I'm trying to do anything. I'm simply asking you to explain to me what happened. Everything was fine <coughs> and dandy. Everything was fine and dandy. Do you all know? Okay, for, for me to tell you this, again, mind you, I've been without him for a day now. I don't know. I, I I mean I don't know what you all want me to tell you because this was not in any way, shape, or form handle the vital intentional. Okay. So you just I didn't him. kill him. You left him there to think about him. I didn't mean to leave him there. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You got up and walked away. How was that not intentionally leaving? Him? Because I'm looking at the hole, knowing that it's, a, it's there. He'll get out no problem. Because you don't, but the, you don't go check on him. You say you're up for 30 minutes, and he doesn't come up. You don't go down and check on him? I'm in the bed. You even move and don't I mean, stop. You move, you admit to moving the suitcase, like, over. So you roll it up. Like, it's not like. I said you wanted to be like that. Don't. You guys are killing me right now. I just want you guys to know. That's how you talk to me most of the time. I don't know how, I don't know how you want me to say it. I'm just trying to figure out what you would expect to happen to somebody when you leave them in a suitcase. I didn't mean to leave him in there. What's your reasoning for um, not calling anyone once there? Because I didn't know what to do and how old I think it was. I called Brian and he's like, what, five minutes later I called you guys? Not even five minutes. Nonetheless, that I had to like try, I was trying to do CPR. I was trying to do CPR. I had to get him out and try to do CPR and then call you guys. And it was continually doing CPR with the dispatch on the phone, where he had me count out loud to help me focus on what I was doing. I don't know how, I mean, you You can sit here all day long and say, I thought you were going to get himself out, but that you didn't. And you went upstairs, and you stayed there for 30 minutes before you fell asleep. How, but can I say too, like, you chose not to ever at any point during that 30 minutes walk back sure. down and check on him. No, wait one second. Because I know, like, with you all, and then, like, because you continually ask me, like, time frames, time frames, time frames, where I told you, like, I don't bother even looking at the clock most of the time. So it's, like, a guesstimate. So I, for all I know, it was, maybe it was 10 minutes. But the point is, you left the living room where he was begging for help and went upstairs. Regardless of how long you were there, you left. You say, I, I thought know. he was the uh, that boy calling wolf. Again. Okay. So when he asked to be let out, like, what's your reasoning for not letting him out? When I was upstairs? No, when he's asking on the video. He asked multiple times. He asked to be let out. I can't breathe. What, like, why didn't you let him out? Well, number one, I, number one, I have no idea it's going to end like that. Okay. Number one. Okay. Uh, number two, just you know what? I'll give you five minutes to show him in. That's we'll give you five minutes to show. Five minutes for what? Well, based on the video, one video is at eleven twelve, and the next one's at eleven twenty three. So you actually gave him at least eleven minutes per video recording. So my my thing is like stop. He asked multiple times. I mean, why? Why did we not let him out? It's just a simple I, question. To be honest with you, I, I mean, I don't want to punish him. No. <laughs> just, well, that's what you're saying in the video. Um, this is what you get. This is no. what you make me feel like. See, and then it's all backfired on me. Like, it's all backfired on me. And I understand the severity of it. I just. You it's awful, I know. Okay. 
It's awful. And I will tell you both this right now, too. I will never drink alcohol again. Like, I will never drink alcohol again. I don't care what it is in any way, shape, or form. I, but let's get back to this. What was the reason for leaving him when he's begging to be let out? I don't understand that. What I have a feeling was, and again, it's the whole time frame thing. You both I, I, don't time frame. I don't care about time frame. So, he's in the bag saying, I am. And I, and I, like, and um, you say, fuck you. When he, so, like, for like the whole few minutes that he was in there, like, I made a little love it. But yeah, good for you. Eleven. Minute, but, but, oh, one video. Well, in between those two videos. Between those two videos. Yeah. So, so, so what? What's the question again? When he's begging for his life, telling you he can't breathe, let me out, and you say fuck you. Why don't you just let him out? What are you trying I to prove to him? There was obviously something in your head that you were thinking of when he was asking the lady. Be let out, you're like, no. Again, it's the boy calling Wolf. Okay, but where does where does this game end? I don't you say this is a game, you got Obviously to like the wrong way. So what was your intention for leaving him in there? And it's not fair. It's not fair. You guys are trying to again. Oh, he's in there. <clears throat> night night. That's what happened. No. That's absolutely what happened. How's it not? You got up off the couch, walked up a flight of stairs, and got in your bed. Thinking he was going to get out. And he didn't, and you still didn't go down the And it's the whole 30 minute thing that you guys are trying to do. Whatever. Like, for all I know, it's 10 minutes. He's begging for his wife to tell him he can't breathe. I don't know what you want me to tell you. Like, I don't. I didn't intentionally mean for this to happen. For you to get to why. You love to in there in the last stage. That's my only issue. Like, what am I supposed to write? What do I write? So my thing is, though, it's what I have a feeling is I went upstairs and just hit the bed kind of thing. But, again, I'm thinking, he'll be up here in a minute. But then I go out. So my question is, why didn't you just let him out prior to going out? I don't know why. He's begging to be let out. He's not laughing. He's not having fun. This, you said, you, you said this was supposed to be fun. You were laughing before. Before you said he was laughing, you were laughing. You went upstairs. He had his fingers out of the bag and he was playing. But obviously that's not the case. So are you guys, uh, so what is it you're trying to, like, what are you trying to figure out? Why? 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 What? Why? What was Why? the motivation for leaving him in the back? Why he was left in the back? Why did I didn't have any motivation. It was me, he and I having a great day, fooling around and being stupid, and apparently me going upstairs and going, hitting the bed, not going to sleep. Or it's like, hmm, I'm tired now, I'm going to sleep. That, that's excluding, you know, it's a good analogy for the day, excluding the fact that he's got uh, uh, a bump on the back of his head, a bump on the front of his head, and his lip is busted. And he has a, oh my a, 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 I, mean, I don't know what you all want me to tell you. Like, this is not fair at all, at all. Yes. That you all are assuming that that's from me. Where else did it come if from? If you were, say it's opposite, you were in the case case, and you're asking to be let out, would you hope that that person would let you out? Like, if you're asking to be let out of the case, should they not let you out? They eventually. I'm guessing. I mean, I don't. I'm blaming it on the wine. Blaming on the wine. So you guys are like assuming that you keep saying we're assuming, or we're not. We're going to tell you anything. Question. But you guys are assuming that that's what I did. No. By what? Like this is the facts of what happened. We got there. You said you pulled him out of the suitcase. You said you went up. You went to bed. We're not assuming that. These are the facts that you're telling us. So now we're like, oh, I'm tired. Oh, I'm tired. So that's what you told me on a corner for the statement yesterday. Because when I said, oh, you went upstairs and passed out, you were like, no, I did not pass out. You got attitude with me because you were assuming, you yeah. thought I was assuming that you were drunk. So that's, that's an assumption. That was an assumption when I said yeah. you passed out. And guess what? You corrected me. 
You were very adamant about the fact that both of you had your website up. <laughs> What's your favorite word you use? Compensated. You used it today, so it's just saying that you guys are within your within your web. <coughs> There's two two empty bottles of wine. Not both, but you drink both of them. I think you did. Like mm, that. There's receipts for the same. They were both purchased yesterday, so I don't know how you did because they weren't there the day before. So one one published receipts from yesterday. Mm -hmm. Only thing purchased on either one was a single bottle of wine. Two of them. So we have each bottle of wine that was in your garbage can that you purchased yesterday, or he purchased, but you two would have consumed together. Okay, well, I, I mean, it's received, so it's not even worth the. So this is. <laughs> so I don't know what you guys are. I don't, I don't know. We were just hoping that we could figure out why you. What was the motivation? There was no motivation. Well, but we're watching a video that after talking to you, everything was ha laughing and fun. Now we're watching a video where it's not laughing and fun. He's begging for his life, and you are in a very angry voice telling him to fuck off. No. Yes, that, that's absolutely what it was. It's not an assumption. <laughs> the video's there. We played it for you. So you guys think that I intentionally... You got walked up the stairs and got in the bed. That was intentional. There's no way of getting around that. You intentionally did that. Nobody drug you up there. You didn't float up the damn stairs. Okay, well, it's not fair. It's not fair that you guys keep trying to say that that's what I did. I don't know what to tell you. You told us that. <laughs> you didn't go upstairs? <laughs> Again. There was a hole in a suitcase. I invented from the hole with one finger. Well, the damn hole didn't do him no good, did it? But he could push it open. No, he did The video no. is him pushing up. And then, if he could push it open, why wouldn't he have gotten out himself? Why would he beg you to open it? Okay. So you can't read. Okay. If somebody can do something for themselves, they're going to do it. They don't need assistance. Unless they need assistance. So why would he and start doing it? Because he couldn't, because it was all the way zipped. Okay. It wasn't. I intentionally didn't do it. That I intentionally did not do. Why not? You didn't actually do it. Zip it all the way. He nor I. Nor. That's why this. Two heads lay hands on each other. No. No. I don't have anything. You're right. He doesn't. Right. Whatever that is, whatever this, whatever it is. He does. <laughs> See, this is what happened. It's not fair that you guys, just because he has those, automatically blame it on me. Like, well, we're what about you? when you had your, your injuries and he gets arrested? Is that not fair? Really? Like, really? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Same thing. He right. Has, he has injuries. You have injuries. Like, what does that mean? I don't have any injuries. Right. Because he and I have not been at it with one another. <laughs> so every time that you guys fight, you, you both hit each other. So you should have probably no. gone to jail all those times that he went to jail. No. Oh, the one time I did. <laughs> but he completely, completely trashed the police report. Because that's nothing what happened. Because the reason why I got taken in is because my story was better than his. So I'm being portrayed as like this right, abuser. We're not saying that he doesn't abuse you. Absolutely. So I'm the one that's being portrayed as you. <laughs> because I have cool. never dealt with anything like this before. I don't know what to do, how to do it. And I always know what to do and how to do it. This, I don't know. So I don't know like what's going on or like. <laughs> We are simply trying to find out as well. Again, we got one side of the story. You're telling us we're going with what you're saying, but then we find stuff that negates what you're telling us. And I don't even remember doing that. Okay. You're telling us that we're assuming stuff, but what we're simply doing is telling you what we saw in the video. And I understand. What you told us. I understand. Because I don't remember that. Okay. Doesn't mean it didn't happen just because you don't remember it. So is the texting thing something about me? Like what's the one? 
Texting? Oh, no, I'm texting. So, I was <laughs> you guys are scaring me, so like I don't know like what to expect. I mean, I have questions of things that need to be taken care of. Like I don't. Okay, you left him in the bag when he's begging you, saying, "I can't breathe. Let me out." And you said, "Fuck you." And you got him off the couch and went upstairs and left him in that bag. Not intentionally. Again. I would never do that to George. You did. Not intentionally. No that. I don't know that. You got up and you went up to bed. Alcohol is a shitty thing. It's alcohol. So Not again. The reason that you have You all listen to me. You all listen. I did not. Not intentionally kill him. So your attention I don't know what it is I need to do or how to do it or what to say or how to say it. But your but what was your intention? Everyone knows. Everyone knows everything that I've done for George and love him and continuously helped him throughout his life with me. And made him a happier, better person. And everybody has a everyone knows that. Everybody has a room. So it's like, okay, so while we're in a good place right now, I'm gonna snap. Is that what it, while we're in a good place well, right now? Yeah. Absolutely. I got you on video screaming, fuck you. This is what it feels like when you're choking me. This is what it feels Which like. Which was how long ago? You said it. Videos from last night. Completely. So what is that? Yeah. They're still feeling towards it. You wouldn't say it if you didn't feel it. <laughs> but I would never do that. But it happens, and you did. But that's not for being playful. But no one's that having a good day. No one's loving me except you. Every that's having a good day. Oh, I'm sorry. I would hate to see a bad day. Y'all are making me out to be the <laughs> person that I'm not. Nor have, or will I ever be. Or are you a different person when you're drunk? People have different personalities okay. after they consume alcohol. It depends. It's like it's. Well, because you're sober now, so sober you. I what about drunk you? you? Not. It's both of us. It's both of us. And it's, again, it's not fair that you all are assuming that the marks that he has on him are from me. We asked you where they came from. I have no idea. Well, nobody else was there, so nobody else was there. I have no idea. I. Where I did not lay a hand on him. You just zipped them in the back. Nor he. You just zipped them in the back. And then you flipped the bag around several times. I didn't do that intentionally. You didn't intentionally flip the bag around? No. Why would I do that? Well, you Good told him to do it. When he was upside down. Right. Well, you had to put him You can't get in a suitcase upside down yeah. because the. Oh my god. Well, you put the yeah, and that's the body. I don't know if that fortune was up there. Nobody else was there. <laughs> that's the worst thing. video me. showing the, the suitcase in several different positions. So uh, it shows one, like she just said, it had to been on its back with the lid open for him to get in there. You just zip it up. Then it shows it on the other side with the minutes. So you had to flip it to there. Then there's another video where it's on its back again. So you had to. Flip I'm leaving it like this, please. I'm leaving it like this. I did not intentionally do this. No malicious intent or effort was towards it. No malicious. I would I'm say this is that you sleep, but you're not sleeping. So. I mean, the, Last the, night, the, I maybe got an hour. Great. In your voice, you can hear the maliciousness. The fuck you is very, very. <laughs> You don't talk to people uh, like that. That's not like a common like hey God, fuck you. That's not that's not common. It's not something people do. And no one that sees that is gonna think that. Okay. So we were trying to give you an opportunity and and it is what it is. There's no maliciousness towards that. So I would probably be telling myself that my intent, intent my intent was not for that <laughs> to happen. But he went upstairs and went to bed. Or maybe he popped out, I don't know. Waiting for him. And the whole time frame thing. It's like, it's regardless. It's not really fair. But it's waiting for him. It's not like you 
you walk up the stairs, no one can, you can't fly up the stairs, no one can take you up the stairs. Okay. You go up the stairs, you lay in the bed, and you wait for him. Who cares if it's five minutes, who cares if it's 30 freaking seconds? He's begging for his life, he's begging to get out. You go upstairs. It doesn't matter. So it it, it gets a time frame out of your mind. It's it's like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because there's this. So it doesn't matter anything what it is I say. So it makes no difference whatsoever. It just you keep you're lying and like you're not you're not changing your body about what? You're now 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 you were drunk. Oh I never said that I was drunk. Exactly what you did here today. That's okay. Everything, everything on alcohol. You blame it on alcohol. Alcohol does a lot to people. Yes, but I never said I was drunk. Yes. So you did okay. that you did that sober. You knowingly left them down there sober. Uh, I have already told those of you also that we were both drinking. Right. You want to admit that you were drunk. Okay. So I'm telling you all both. This has changed my life. I will take this. I don't know. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. But you're trying to dance around the fact that <laughs> so you So what were you on? Okay, just... You left them in there. You didn't try to dance around the fact that you left them in there. It's just not... Like, you didn't leave them in there. It's not cool. Like, this is not cool. Not cool. You said it. You said it. But you think that I did that intentionally. You think... But I did that intentionally. You intentionally left them in there and left the room. You went upstairs to a different room. You intentionally did that. You you did. Yes. Because I'm thinking he's gonna get out. Okay, he didn't. Obviously not. When somebody's begging for their begging saying I But when you say that though, but you have to tell me out. I can't. No, 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 more so. Like again, I thought it was a boy crying wolf. So it's just like what? Oh, so if your son was in there and said I can't breathe, are you gonna open or is is he nine? So he's not you know, really it's not a big deal. Same question. Oh, you said you would never put your son in a suitcase. You would only put George in there. No, George got in a suitcase. Not all the way and not intentionally to leave him there. You keep going away from that. That's exactly what happened. Are you all trying to have me admit that? Like, are you trying to have me admit that? Because I will never admit it because it's not true. It's not true. I'm basically saying it's a fact that that's what happened. Okay. You videotape them asking to be let out. You go upstairs. So what, guys? So what? Like, I don't know what you want me to say. Other than it was not out of maliciousness or intentional. I don't know what or how I can say it. I love George. Love him. To this day, still. Love him. Love makes you crazy. It doesn't do, it's not one of those things where it's like, oh gosh, you know what? I've done enough for you at this point. I never gave up on him. Why I'm here today, I'm still not giving up on him. I would do anything for him. When you gave up checking up on him. Oh gosh. Okay. We're simply just trying to go through. I mean, again, you gave us a completely different story that you churched up to. This was such a, a lasting matter. It was, it was fun. All day. All day. All day. Anybody look at it? I don't think anybody will look at that video and go, George is having fun right now. So why is it you all think that I, I, y'all don't know me, don't know me, you know, would do something like that, especially having a nine-year-old son? Like, why, like, why are you so, why are you so, like, caught on to what we think when, because you should be more concerned about what you told us. It's because and like you guys are like trying to, the things that the video shows that are opposite of what you told us and then what you know. Like what is opposite? Well you said that it was funny when you're the only one. We were playing before that. Okay. Um But then it stopped. 
Yeah. Then I usually stop the screaming fun. Well, I. Because you're screaming at him. He's not going to get it. I don't know what you all want me to tell you. In no way, shape, or form, but he's intentional. At all. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So in that case, mm -hmm. then it's the of him being in the suitcase. Or if you don't bring it out, we get it. That's what she's determining. So the ones on the head, I, I asked her to have them in the suitcase, and she said she didn't think so. I didn't touch him, nor did he touch me. Okay. I'm going to be in a dad. Um, so, I don't know if you all know how to do this because I, so that's what I'm going to ask you to ask. So, are you all updating his parents today or when he gets final, whatever? What does it matter for? What we tell his parents to do? Because I, I, we're going to have, we're going to talk to it with them. Okay, and I have, but it's going to come down to me. What do you mean? Like, so it's being put on me. Who said that? But I'm not, so what if we can tell them? <laughs> We're gonna give them an update, just like we gave you an update on their autopsy. Okay, so it's whatever group. Well, here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We, we had to deliver news to them last night that their son was dead. There's not a whole lot of conversation that goes on after that. It's not a very easy thing. Was it yesterday or Sunday? Sunday. Today's Tuesday, right? Did we not meet you yesterday? We met you yesterday. Yeah. I'm just asking. Right? Did you not meet yesterday? It's a valid question. Uh, really? Yes, on Monday. Okay. Got it. Perfect. So I don't know if I asked you guys or how I find this out other than talking to his parents, which is not gonna happen. You know, probably sure what I'm doing. What how do you guys suggest me finding out about the funeral? That's not even something that's been probably talked about between the family. That's not something we ask. We have no way of I didn't know that's why I'm asking. So, it would be up to them to make their own sense of what they want to do. She just told you this quick, just being told last night, I'll pretty much be willing to wager that they have not even considered what they're going to do. I thought he can't even be released. No, so. I've been there with parents, grandparents, and uncles. Um, so I don't know if I have the right to or not, but like I was going to call his former employees whom he really cared for and let them know. You can call whoever you want. I just don't want to do something that I'm not supposed to. Um, how do I go about getting his um, wedding ring, engagement ring? Is that the medical examiner's office? It'll come to us eventually and um, then... It'll be released to the oh, university. Yeah. yeah, okay. I bought it for him. Okay, it's a civil issue. It was on his finger, it goes to them, they're the ones that are going to release it. We don't have any say in them. So I won't get that back. So for all of this, like, how do I find out what's what, how many, like, what's been found? What do you mean? Uh, pillow with stain, stain from pillow, suitcase. That won't be sent off to. Jelly, pork, caramel, pork, yeah. they do their testing. So, and then, like, whatever white can with blood and necktie with blood was from the suitcase. Okay. Why would you guys, um, you'll see it in there, the baseball bat, for Lucas. And the seat. And this is just his phone, my phone, and the laptop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when anything can be released, we will release it, but we are very early in this investigation. And it's not so, a learning process, unfortunately. So, what's next? They're going to come and swap their fingers. No, I'm talking about like in the long run. Like, what do I need to like, do I need to be doing something or like, I can't tell you what to do. I mean, like, so like for. Like, I don't understand, like, I don't know if you guys are just going to, like, because it makes it sound like, to me, like, I'm being accused of something that was not intentional. I'm being accused of it. And a handful of other things that I'm being accused of. 
So I don't want to be at home with Lucas and you guys show up. So this earth, we're still in my street. The word, I don't know what you want me to tell you. So is there going to be concrete whatever it is? And then it's like, okay, this is what it is kind of thing? Or like, because I've done the whole court thing. I've done the whole attorney thing. I've done whatever. So if I'm not admitting anything about being intentional and I killed George. <clears throat> That's not the situation, but it's trying to depend on me. That was not my intent. But it's trying to depend on me. So however or whatever it is I need to do in order for that to be proven, then I need to do stuff, which is why I'm trying to get my ducks in a row. So that's why I'm asking what the next step is other than me getting my nails swapped. I mean, you want me to tell you how to not be accused of a crime? Is that what you're asking? Like, I don't know what you're I'm trying to prepare myself for whatever may need to be done so I can yeah, I guess, I stick up for myself. I mean, I think you're doing just fine. You came, you talked. I just don't want you guys to, again, show up and look at the mouth. Well, we did tell you yesterday that we don't want to do anything around your son. That's why you came to us. So I don't know why you think that's going to change. That and or me not just show up back home. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Not or what? Me just not show up back home. That's why. Oh, he's so happy that I'm staying over the house for Brian. I'm so happy. And I'm not going back to the house, to my house for however long I can to stay over here because of whatever to blow over. Mm -hmm. And again, if you don't mind me asking, so for whatever it is you all are claiming from the videos, which, yeah, it's, is that what you're going to tell him? Like his parents? It's like, oh yeah, by the way, she did. Did what? I mean, what would you tell him? I don't think it really matters what we're going to tell the parents. Oh, yeah, it is. It's steel to the fire. Well, we can't hide things. And I don't know. I, I'm not saying we're going to go. <clears throat> I'm not saying that we're going to go and tell them every single thing we have. Um, but again, this is the Orange County Sheriff's Office of Public Records. So eventually, like, this all will come out. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, I'm not. You're making it sound like we're going to tell them something, so then your life is in danger, and I don't like that accusation. So let's just nip that in the butt right now. Well, that's what's going to happen. I cannot. But, I I cannot, really but we can't even. But so <laughs> there's no concrete report yet, even. Right. So, so it's um, you want me to like tell you exactly what I'm going to tell them. Back. I don't know what I'm going to tell them. I don't know what I'm going to tell them. Let's just think about that. Just like you don't know why you went upstairs. I don't know what I'm going to tell them. So, can, can, I, can, I, can I tell you the way that I did last time? Yeah, my phone is fine. This should be there. I don't know. I get it. Look, I get it. That was really bad. So that's what scares me. Like, what do I need to plan on? Like, what do I need to plan on? I promise you, on my son's life, it was not intentional. I promise you, on Lucas's life, it was not intentional. <clears throat> I don't know you. I can't say I know anything about you. I don't know what is what would be a true statement or what not. I mean, if you're promising on your son's life, that's fine. That's how much it means. Sorry. That's how much it means. That's how much it means. Okay. I hope you take that to heart. Please. It's documented that you said that again. I get it. Mm 
Do you have any idea when I can get my phone back? What do you say? I just said that. I mean, it, our digital currency is, um, we have a lot of cases on the plate. I mean, well, and that's not how you see my laptop, it's with this laptop. So you play, you'll see all the games that he has on there. As soon as we can get that back to Lucas, we will. As soon as we can release your phone, we will. But there's, we have no way of being able to tell you because we don't have control over their case other than how they, they arrange what they do. So I don't know. And at this point, I think, honestly, with everything else, else that's going on, it should probably be at the bottom of your list of words. I'm trying to make Lucas happy so he can have his laptop back. Well, I mean, did Brian not have a laptop for him? He has his laptop that he has to do for work, but he doesn't want him using it or breaking or dropping. It's not a big deal. There's nothing on the laptop anyway. So you will keep me posted, like updated. That's my thing, is I'm trying to figure out what I need to do in the meantime. I don't know, I can't, like I don't know what to tell you about. Like what am I, what? But you all have more information than I do where it's like, yeah, you might want to, or yeah, you might want to. Like we have more information on what? Like, we told you everything that we have. You know everything that we know. And most of what we got from you. But, uh, like I was telling her, like, yeah, that's bad. Like, which I swore my son's life was not intentional. So that's why I'm trying to figure out what I need to do for myself. Okay going forward with it, nonetheless, with his family. And are you all just showing up with Lucas and Alan? Because we're already both told you that we need to be mindful of any situations. So do you guys, I guess you're going to call me tomorrow? Or do I have to come back down here? Yeah. I'll chat with you next time. I have no idea what I'm going to call you next. Uh, isn't the report come out tomorrow? What report? I'm just saying the report is generated through us and the sheriff's office is a public entity. So if someone were to come request something, then... No, I'm talking about, um, it's all talking. She's waiting and doing our follow up, but. Yeah, she's looking at him. <laughs> yeah. But she won't be finished with him because she's, she's having to go with her stuff. <clears throat> so, after this, what? I'm done? For now? How long does this stuff take to get back? The idea of the You won't get back. The swamps and stuff will stay. I don't know about it. I'm just asking. I keep calling my phone. I keep having to have other people call me to the end. I hope you all can really both truly understand that that was not my intent. I miss him a lot. Mm -hmm. no, I, but my question has remained the same. What do you expect to happen to somebody when you leave on a position like that? 
Yes, but you have to understand too. I mean, yeah, just what would you expect to happen to somebody when you leave them in the position? I have no idea because I've never done it before. Why have you never done it before? Why would I? Exactly. Why, why did you do it before? Why did you do it now? I, I clearly have said why. Why? No, you don't know why. You no, you just know that it's not intentional, but you don't know why. But that's okay. Yeah. I'm not trying to force you to say something that you don't know. <coughs> I wish you guys would feel that I'm that kind of person. We're not assuming anything. We're going by the fact that it happens. Like you said, you don't know me. And so, for me to have to live with getting him out and doing what I did is punishment enough. I think that's why I haven't slept. I think I'll tell you, see, so that right there says something. Not my intention. Are you trying to make it worse? Sorry, what? 
Are you trying to make it worse? Make what worse? <laughs> How I feel.
There's nothing that I can do in order to go home and see Lucas and prepare. You'll be afforded the time in court. You'll be afforded an attorney. You'll be afforded a chance to talk to a judge, and all that stuff will be worth it. But what's the time frame for that, though? I have no way of being able to tell you. You should make the first appearance by the tomorrow morning or last night. And how things are busy, how quickly you get down there. I, I have a short commission to be signed And I need water, like, really bad days. I just got those. Okay. Yeah, you're not allowed in the jail. So I can't even smoke cigarettes in my bathroom. What? Am I going? Jesus. And what am I going to do with my car? Did you find where it is? When you get down there, you'll have three phones, you'll be able to call. What, is this possible? Yeah, once you get down in there, get with them, you'll be able to uh, use a phone in the, in the way. But how long will that take if I need to talk to Brian? Yeah, no, it depends how busy, how quickly they get you through. Um, I would say within the hour. It's a pre-phone yeah. call yeah. In, the, in the lobby. It's a pre-phone call. All of them are bringing their phone yeah. to see where they come to. She has no clue. So can I ask you, or whoever, um, those holding cells, the holding cells, mm -hmm. am I going to be talking about those? I don't know. Last time I had a panic attack. Okay. Let them know that. Yeah. I don't know. Well, you, you're familiar with the big bay. As long as you go in and you act civil to them, they'll set you in the big bay. You'll be left there. And so you that when I'm in? No, that's not what's mm -hmm. asked. We don't work at the jail. As long as, as, long as we can say, you don't act You don't act like this. You'll go in and they'll put you in the big bay. If you go in there screaming and kicking and yelling and cursing, do I don't know. I'm just letting you know that's what happens. That's how they, they weed people out. If you go in acting like this, so I ask for the big bang? They'll put you there as long as you're acting like this. I got the last time I had a major man attack on the building. Hey, Lynn. Thank you. Where am I going to do my first? Okay. It first is going to come, but the clear up is going to end, so. I put in the cycle through a lot of girls too. Oh, no, that's all right. Mine are not autism. Cool. What did you all decide to do this? We made it to decide to do this. Uh huh. Georgia said. You said, I knew this was going to happen. You did? Okay. So I came back to the village. Yeah, absolutely. When you were trying to figure out what's going on, we're still trying to figure out what's going on. Unintentionally. Don't forget, I have my, I don't know if it's maple syrup on. I have things in my car that I need to. What kind of stuff do you have in the car that you really want? Well, I have my medication. Okay, they have a pharmacy there, so if there's something that you have to have right away, you'll be seeing the medicine. It's cancer packed up. Again, when you get checked in, we're going to be seeing the medicine. And that they have a pharmacy there, so they'll be able to take care of any kind of that stuff. That protocol is out of my realm. I don't work on this, I don't know, but I do know they do have a pharmacy. And that you will be reported to see somebody. Okay? Hold on. Yes, sir. I can put it right yeah. All right. Yep. <clears throat> Judge, can we approach the bench? Yes. All right, members of our jury, I have an instruction that I need to read to you at this time. You have heard and watched a recorded interview that contained opinions and statements by Detective Lowen and Detective Copsell to Sarah Boone. These opinions and statements are pertinent only to explain the reactions and responses they elicit. You are not to consider these opinions and statements by the police officers as true, but only to establish the context of Sarah Boone's reactions and responses. You may continue. Ma'am, did, did all of these events uh, that you have testified to in regards to your investigation, did they all occur in Orlando, Orange County, Florida? Yes, they did. 
And ma'am, do you see the person today here in court who admitted to zipping up George Torres in the suitcase? Yes, I do. Do you see the person today here in court whose voice you heard on the suitcase video taunting George Torres? Yes. Do you see the person here today in court who admitted to you flipping George Torres while he was in the suitcase? Yes, I do. And do you see the person today here in court who admitted going to bed while George Torres continued to suffer in the suitcase? Yes, I do. Could you please identify that person by an article of clothing they're wearing? Yes, she's at the defense table in black and I guess a pinkish top. Your Honor, may the record reflect that the witnesses identified the defendant? The record will so reflect. No further questions at this time. Members of the jury, it is 5.59. I tried to get you out of here before 6. Uh, we will continue with the balance of the state's presentation tomorrow at 9 a.m. I'm going to give you another instruction similar to what I've read you previously over the last couple of days. Jurors, you must not conduct any investigation on your own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, or using a computer, cell phone, the internet, any electronic device, or any other means at all to get information related to this case or the people and places involved in this case. This applies whether you are in the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in the trial or use the internet to look at maps or pictures to see any place discussed during the trial. Jurors do not watch local news or read local newspapers. Jurors must not have discussions of any sort with friends, family members, or even your fellow jurors about the case or the people and places involved. So do not let anyone make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. I want to stress again that just as you must not talk about this case face to face, you must not talk about this case by using an electronic device. You must not use phones, computers, or other electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept any messages related to this case or your jury service. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all including posting information on an internet website, chat room, or blog. With that, members of the jury, will be in recess for this evening. We will see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. And again, I thank you for your attention and your sacrifice in this matter. Jury actually. Y'all may be seated. State anything else we need to uh, discuss this evening? Uh, I received a motion from the defense that I guess they called at 5.08 p.m. regarding the witness Pearl Walker to appear by Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, it is not something I can agree to, and I'm not sure if they're meeting for deposition or trial or both. It doesn't specify. You know, I talked to uh, Miss Walker's daughter, who is her caregiver, and they're going to have her down here at six o'clock at the state attorney's office for the deposition, and then uh, they'll go from there. Devin Beck's going to be handling the deposition, but she's outside. She's outside the courtroom, Judge. Okay. Uh, specifically referring to a motion for witness to appear via Zoom, filed October twenty first, twenty twenty four, at five oh eight p.m. The court has reviewed it. Um, we can address this tomorrow after you've had the opportunity to take the deposition. I, I would just submit based on what we've just heard, she can appear in person because she has. Is that your final position? Yes, sir. Okay. I, I think, I think it, it would be wise to ask her those kind of questions from the lawyer so they would get, be able to give a more detailed response about why she didn't want to appear in court. But uh, I understand their position. Here's, here's the, the problem that I have. The rule 3.116D requires or allows the court to have virtual testimony or remote testimony if all parties consent. And I'm not hearing consent on behalf of the state attorney's office. And in reviewing the other portions of that specific rule, it all follows if there's consent. So I can't allow your request based on the lack of consent between the parties. 
So for the record, the motion for witness to appear via Zoom filed today, October 21, 2024, is denied in accordance with Rule of Criminal Procedure 3.116, Section D, Paragraph 1. Judge, and the only other thing is we're trying to logistically get our witnesses here. We've got to fly one in, and, and of course, Mr. Walker and the experts. Just, I'm just asking for what their, their plan is for their case for tomorrow. So we covered it um, up at the bench, I thought. This is our last witness. It's up to them on how long they cross her. I thought we anticipated Ms. Boone taking the stand at 10 a.m. My, my understanding, and my understanding was that Mr. Henderson's that Mr. Catchtory had no further questions for Detective Kepsel, and that we would tender her for cross tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Mr. Henderson had advised it would be 30 to 45 minutes. Taking the worst case scenario, that would be 10 uh, 9:45, built in 15 minutes for redirect. I don't know if it's going to take that long. We will then. Um, remove the jury. Once the state rests, we will address any motions. I will colloquy your client on a couple of different matters, and then I will turn it over to you. So I would say that a start time, a good range would be between 10 and 1030. I hope we don't have the same delays we had this morning with access. It's Tuesday, not Monday. There may be less jurors, so it may allow better efficiency in moving our panel in. But as soon as the state rests, uh, I intend on moving to motion, colloquy your client, and Turning the ball over to you, sir, for you to call your first witness. Prior to Sarah Boone testifying, I am going to want to view with her the suitcase and the bags. Understood. Okay. Anything else? State? No, Your Honor. Defense? No, sir. All right. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thank you very much. You are the unrelated matter.